if you want to have some, a famous person talk to you, you bring them into a group and introduce them all. They can't really walk away then. Today, on that one time, I'm joined by Brad Blanks. Some of the people you've spoken to, Tom Cruise, Angelina Jolie, Robert De Niro, Jennifer Aniston, Will Smith, Oprah Winfrey, George Clooney, and Robert Downey Jr. It's the art of bamboozlement. There were moments where I hustled into a George Clooney red carpet and George Clooney's introducing me to people. Do you ever reflect back and go, how the f did this happen? No, no I'm, I'm doing that right now. <laughs> oh my God, that's awful. There were so many moments where it should have all went wrong. They dressed me up as Monica Lewinsky and we were going to trick or treat uh, Bill and Hillary Clinton's house. And we're driving down the street and the police come and it was the sheriff. He goes, oh, I'm the sheriff of the town here. I'm dressed as Monica with the wig and everything you know, going on. And he goes, you're looking for the Clintons? And I went, yeah, yeah, yep, yep. He goes, let me show you where they live. And I went, I said, why are you doing it? He goes, oh, it's actually pretty funny on the radio. And I lived and died at the end of the day, whatever was on air. I fucking loved you when you were fat. You, you fuck. <laughs> Oh. I'm like, I'm gonna get fired from this job, but I'm gonna go as hard as I possibly can. So when I do get fired and I'm sitting in my local pub, my country town, and I'm talking to my mate, I'm gonna have a story for them. Now I gotta interview a real movie star. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> Brad Blanks. Adam, cool. great to see you. Welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thank you. Great to be here. Of course. Yeah, you know, uh, it's been yep, yeah, it's been a while. I've been dodging you, but you know, uh, <laughs> finally in your arms. We are. Yeah, I'll give yeah. you a big hug at yeah, the end. Yep, big yep, sweaty yep, hug. Yes, good. I love that. <laughs> you know, um, two big guys. You know, exactly. uh, but but I'm sorry. I've, I'm excited to be here. I've seen you've had some amazing guests. So yeah, and we're adding be, one more to well, the, uh, the well, notch. Yeah, it's just yeah, some bloke that you found on the streets in New York, and you've bundled me in here. So uh, <laughs> thanks for having me. Of yeah. course. Uh, look, I'm 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 very excited to have you on here, man. You're uh, the the work you've done is very interesting, quite inspiring for me as a human in New York, coming from Australia. It's like the path that you have kind of paved gives you know myself and you know potentially even Joe just the ability to understand that we can do we can do this too so yeah it's 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 amazing like just some the people some of the people you've spoken to like well i've got like i i went into chat gpt right, yeah. and i i one of my processes when i do my interviews is i get every piece of content i can find and i put all the transcripts into chat GPT yep. and I start writing questions and Great. asking questions around it and I'm like give me an exhaustive list of all the people that he's interviewed and the list oh, wow. is insane oh, that, wow. I'll send it to you later if you'd like yeah, it's a good. big big so, list so chat GPT likes me well, so apparently so, wow. but we've got right. Tom Cruise, Angelina Jolie, Robert De Niro, Jennifer Aniston, Will Smith, Oprah Winfrey, Taylor Swift, George Clooney, Meryl Streep, Robert Downey Jr. I'm like, what are the top 10 most famous yeah. ones? Then? That's yeah, that's a, good, that's a good list. It's not a bad start. Yeah, yeah, it was, uh, yeah and it's, uh, yeah, I, I don't even think that because I, you know, because at the time I'm just sort of hunting the chat because uh, when I get it, it's not over, but well, yeah. I guess we'll get to that. Yeah, you know, that part. You know, when I when I get the chat. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, on that on the beginning of that. So, who is Ricky Gervais to you, and what impact has he had on your life? Oh, Ricky, Ricky's uh, been a fantastic. I was a huge fan of The Office, and and I was living in London when it actually debuted, and yeah, and it's that whole you know breaking the fourth wall comedy as we all know now. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the time, it was yeah, it was, it was England had been doing a great job in their television of making shows like that that hadn't really hit as much and then his hit and uh, I, I then moved to the States and uh, kept figuring out I think I got the tape videotape sent or the DVD my sister was in London she sent them over to me I kept watching and then he debuted on the BBC you know maybe the end of 03 um, yeah that's end of 03 the office finally got to America and off the back of that he won a Golden Globe you know, him and Merchant won best comedy show and he, I think he won Best Actor in a Golden Globe. And that was their big night. That might have been the beginning of 04. But he still hadn't cracked it. And uh, I remember I got, I got Disney rang me up and said, oh, we've got this English actor, Ricky Gervais. Uh, do you want to interview him, Brad? I had a really good relationship with Disney and promoting their films. And, and at the time, my radio station was owned by Disney. So, you know a bit of back scratching going on. So mm -hmm. I said, oh, yes, mm -hmm. I would love to interview Ricky Gervais. And I uh, went to the Essex Hotel and it was only four journalists. And again, I am not a journalist. <laughs> um, um, you know, that I, that I, you know, I, I wanted to chat to get, I don't even think my, the guys, the show that I was on, my bosses, 
probably would not have even played the interview. I would have had to really hard sell them to put a Ricky Gervais interview on the air. Mm. Uh, and and I went in there and I filmed this interview of him and I and I didn't have any backlighting or you reckon he could have helped me as a director. But I <laughs> did this 10 minute, you know, nervous interview of him and he was in a, a comic, uh, a, a bird movie with Ewan McGregor, mm. some, some movie you know, that he, a cartoon uh, movie. He was the vo- he voiced it and did this interview with him for 10 minutes and it was just great. And I went, what a great guy. And, and then I, every year I'd run into him and it just, we, we sort of clicked and I think it just gets back to the size of the roundness. I'm maybe not sort of the size, the roundness of my head. And I know he's you know, fascinated with Carl Pilkington, his good friend, and the roundness. And I think my head was had similar oddities to it. And that's when he would start hanging shit on me ab- about that. And every time we would catch up, it was... Um, yeah, and we would put on a, a pretty good show of abusing each other and um, some great comic relief. And it was, I mean, it's great to go head to head with one of the great, you know, the quickest guys. I always say about Gervais is he, you want, when I would ask him a question, I would want to stutter in my question, you know, uh, or, or slow it down or be a little bit rambling because you could see in his eyes the extra beats you could give that guy would – would uh, y- his brain was generating comedy at such a quick pace. <laughs> the longer I would give him to generate it, the bigger the punchline. So that was one That was one guy you'd, I'd want to ramble with for mm-hmm. him to – to, to, to smash me over the head with something hilarious. <laughs> I've watched uh, that little clip of you guys insulting each other probably a hundred times. It yeah. is one of the funniest things. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so that was so that's five years into our interviewing relationship, so and, and I I probably got comf- super yeah, confident. Yeah. You got him arrogant. good. It was yeah, so yeah, funny. Yeah, and I hit a nerve. I think it was like you were funnier when you were fat. <laughs> it was so good. Yeah, yeah, which is a very sad, a very mean thing to say. I'm a big guy, and uh, but saying that to a comedian when they lose weight. It's one of the a comics' great, um, great Achilles heels. Comedians losing weight uh, yeah, can always change their uh, their routines or, or their their comedy. And uh, he knew he knew that I was on on to him on that. It was very good. He was he was very very funny. Yeah, I, uh, I like. Well, I mean, it says something about the way you can deliver information, which is. You know, you, you you do it in a lighthearted way that doesn't come across as aggressive. It seems. Yeah, oh, for sure. For sure. Look, I, at the end of the look, I, I was on a, a radio show, and my whole trick uh, in New York City. So I had to find a way to be to to get invited to the after party to drink free beer while also uh, still being edgy to be able to play that interview to my masters the mm. following morning. Mm-hmm. To, sorry to use that word, but it's like <laughs> they were my bosses yeah. and I lived and died at the end of the day, whatever was on air. So yeah. I could pat myself on on, my, on the back so for you getting get paid a, per on air. No, no, it was, it was, I was a full, it was a okay, jo- a right. job. Okay, yeah. Okay. And, um, but, but still they could fire. I mean, you, you could, uh, I could be fired, you know, Tomorrow. any moment. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, so, you know, I, I was a sidekick on a, you know, a, a big, uh, bre- well, they call them morning shows here, mm-hmm. as yeah, as opposed to breakfast in Australia. Big, uh, you know, one of New York's biggest breakfast shows, and uh, and uh, I lived and died by the output. And, and then my interviews were designed in a way then to give the hosts, my bosses, to enable them to be funny off the back of my interviews, mm-hmm. my screw up or my what you know, whatever I did in that interview, they then had to have a reaction to it. So. Uh, uh, it was a bit. It was a, a great bit, and and my, you know, that's why I always push back when people say, "Oh, you're an entertainment reporter." I said, "No, I wasn't an. Mate, you look at me. I'm not an entertainment reporter. I was a hapless, um, a hapless sort of this. My character was this this guy that was just in the wrong place at the <laughs> at the right, <laughs> at the right time. time. Yeah, and 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 I was playing this this role of getting these huge stars to talk to me but not being mean to them and being kind in the interviews but but knowing as I'm chatting to them that they like who the fuck is this? Yeah, yeah who the fuck is this at the beginning and them knowing halfway through the interview it was always my favourite moment when I could see the glint in their eyes come in and knowing aha we're into something and this and you got to remember I, for many years I was the last one on the red carpet uh, yeah. of, 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 I'm talking 30 people in front of me all asking the same questions and, and it would get to me and I had nothing to lose I you know but 
uh, but I they knew that once they did me, oh, good, I'm in, I'm done. Yeah. Um, but then I'd keep them. I'd get them for three minutes, four minutes, and we'd have this chat, and and then they'd walk away and like, oh, and I'd remember that they turned to their publicist and go, oh, we're done, oh, we're done now. I'd hopefully leave them in a happier place than than the the torture that they'd had before me. <laughs> hopefully, yeah. Um, uh, but but yeah, so it was there, there was some construction into the interviews and the the chats to to be able to then replay those chats the following morning yeah so okay so the core the core part of that role was basically to to get interesting bites and then then have them played on the radio the exactly. next day for sure exactly that was that was the goal and as i said before to to do it in a way that, that was going to be funny for the audience uh but enable me to get free beer and free shrimp at the after party because you know uh, you know like i'm in new york city i'm spending everything i'm making i'm reinvesting all my cash into myself and my adventures mm. and uh every night i knew that the the audio was just a, a small part of the whole story. That the after party was just get, was me saying that I went to, you know, a Jack Nicholson after party and I was hovering around him all night in the hope of chatting to him. And then finally, when I got the chance, the courage to go up to Jack Nicholson after I'd smashed seven beers and <laughs> eaten, you know, three plates of roast beef and <laughs> shrimp and and then I'd go Sounds up like to Christmas. him and, and I go to Jack as he's sitting there the king of Hollywood sitting there in New York City and beautiful massive restaurant everyone too scared to talk to him but I went up and said hey Jack I'm Brad hey, hey Brad nice to meet you and uh, I go uh, Jack Jack um can, can I ask you one question and uh, um he, he goes that was your one question, <laughs> and then the and but I got all that on tape, and then that would and I'm like, well, it sucked, but that would be my audio for the following morning, and it still would work. Yeah, 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 great. So, w- with that in mind, could you give us an elevator pitch of who you are, <laughs> what you do, and how you're contributing to the world? Oh, jeez. Um, <laughs> I, I, as you can tell, I don't take myself very seriously, so I don't know if I'm contributing, kind of contributing that. Um, uh, that much to the world other than, you know, trying to, trying to be a happy guy myself. And, you know, hopefully if anyone sees any of the stuff I do, they get a, a slight smile or, uh, you know, a, I mean, a little, again, I've uh, laughed hysterically. All right, well, thank you. All right, so, <laughs> so uh, maybe you're underselling yeah, it. I, a I, little I, bit. Yeah, look, I hope I'm putting something, yeah, yeah, something that's into the world of, of that you hopefully see someone that's a kind guy that I'm um, having a chat. So if, if you're going to talk from a world perspective, but, but you know, my elevator pitch is, you know, I, I've loved, I've loved talking to people in these moments in these and creating these pub like, you know, pub chats, you know, how I sort of grew up watching how my father and growing up in a small country town and how people chatted around the footy club and, 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 you know, there might be slight ribbing, but everyone had a sort of common goal to get to the, the crux of what everyone's trying to do. Mm-hmm. And, and when you got to the center of someone, you know, it, inside that's when people would open up and the real laughs would 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 happen and i think that's sort of what i'm still trying to do you know in everyday life not necessarily recording it and putting it online but i hope i'm walking down the street and if i get chatting to someone i'll learn about them pretty quickly and and get get to the inside and hopefully have a laugh and then be on my way Mm -hmm. Uh, you mentioned your your early years shaping the way you communicated in in new york so what, what are some of the contexts around that that you know has brad here now but the, in, in, like you're talking the just like it, just like the context of how your your family developed and like what oh. what led to you know yeah. you coming here oh, yeah, great, and then great, having great, this yeah, ability yes, to yes, just yeah, yeah no 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 it's a, it is funny look look I grew up you know um, my my mother was had a, and it, yeah she has a great imagination and uh, and she <laughs> and we, we would I lived in a small town I'd drive for an hour it's with Cobram, her right? Cobram yeah, yeah and drive you know along to Wangaratta I remember her parents lived in Wangaratta and all of those trips I would just hear these stories from her of um of of uh global or m- more american of gossip mm. and, and and you know she loved the stories of movie stars and things and, and i i would always listen to these chats and so i was building this database of of people i would be watching on tv and, I, and then i would know their life stories after that and that mm. was that was pretty much from from my mum and that and that would lead in any any famous figure at the time you know this is like as a seven eight nine year i would i would i was learning people's i was becoming an addict to biographies and 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 how each person fit into fitted into each person's life and you know who met who on a movie or who mm. 
who, you know, in, in Australia's context, who played footy where and went to somewhere else? Are they friends? And you know, I, I was, I, I love the, um, the the spider web, I guess, of people and how they all uh, mix together. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and and that was put into me by my mum, no, no doubt, uh, for sure. So, uh, and then from my father's uh, side, that's probably where I get the, the wildness and uh, the, the, um, the the putting the putting on the show mm -hmm. and he, he was a great showman and uh, still is a, a you know a great showman and, and and a salesman and he was the president of the footy club and you know I'd watch him putting on you know speeches uh, you know once a week uh, you know after a win or a loss so I'd be like a nine ten year old kid watching my dad make a speech to a hundred people mm -hmm. and so that has you know, that f feeds into me. And I, I, at that stage, I didn't think I was going to have any career in media or anything along those lines. Um, and, and then, you know, and I grew up in this town of Cobram and down the road was Yarrawonga and we had we had two at the time, Cobram Peaches and Cream Festival, which was this, the, the biggest, at, you know, in Australian open air festival, music festival. And so we'd have the biggest rock acts coming in and playing um, playing at the, the Peaches and Cream. So, and, and my dad and my uncle and all their friends, we're, we, you know, we were all involved in that. I'd be backstage there. I remember one night at, in Yarrawonga, it was Rock, Yarrawonga Rockalonga, and, <laughs> and my uncle owned that festival and ran that festival, and I was assigned Johnny Diesel's wife. Who, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and and that was my job as like a 15-year-old. I, I was her like assistant for the Next night. Next you know, said, you guys yeah, are in the porta yeah, porta. Yeah, yeah, yeah. me and her. <laughs> me, me, yeah, there was a lot of love between her and uh, Johnny Diesel uh, as he came off. But yeah, he started, and I love Johnny Diesel. You know, and and, um, and of, of course, yeah, there was all that. So I, I had I, I saw showbiz up front, and um, not that I became a rock star and have any music ability, but I got to see all you know all the, the backstage effects of of that. So that's all sort of that's embedded, I think, gave in comfort. Yeah, gave, in. yeah knowing <clears throat> that I you know that if I got to a stage where I'm you know in front of five thousand people at a comic con and I'm hosting an event with uh, you know Neil Patrick Harris, I I'm not going to be too you know in awe of that moment, you know, yeah. or something like that. So, well, on that, on that note, what, what was the biggest pinch me moment of your career for your mum? Oh, has no, she had any? No, no, look, she's always been, I think she, you know, mum's good, but they're just quietly confident in, in their kids. And she, you know, no, she's never, she's always been, she wouldn't have mattered, you know, where I ended up. She, she like, I sit there and go, aren't you sad that I left you, that I went <laughs> to New York and I've been over here, like approaching 25 or 24 years. And she's like, no, no, I sort of always knew you were going to go over, you know, to America or, or go overseas somewhere. And I said, all right, mum, as long as you don't, you know, upset with me that mm -hmm. you don't get to see grandchildren all the time, and and so uh, she's fine. No, I don't think there's any pinch me. Yeah, she she'd be. Yeah, she just generally quite, happy gen for happy, the pathway happy. Yeah, that you've exactly. gone down. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah. What about for you? Was there a moment where you've gone? You know, small town boy, <laughs> Cobra. <Yeah. laughs> you're, you're somehow got yourself into this <laughs> mess. Yeah, <laughs> it's, like, it's funny. You're like, I, how I, the I, fuck did this happen? I, I, get, I get that all the time. I still get it. Small uh, people. Old friends go, geez, for small town, where? Yeah, from we, Cobra, we're from yeah. Geelong. Yeah, yeah right. I get it. Yeah, yeah, we yeah get I, it. I get it all the time. And I, I'm like, I don't really, I've never, I've probably never reflected that much because you just sort of, you know, uh, you're just on the on the on the front. You're just looking ahead. You're just pushing forward. Um, well, I'll send you this yeah. list. <laughs> oh yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Crazy. Look, look. It was and it was all. Everything was always done. You know, in, in the early days. Or, you know, and still is. Is it was always done for the story. What What's yeah. the What's the bigger? How can I? You know, in my early days on radio, when I say early days, in my first year of radio, I'm like, I'm going to get fired from this job, but I'm going to go as hard as I possibly can. So when I do get fired and I'm sitting in my local pub, uh, in the, the pub I had my first beer in, it, you know, in my country town, and I'm talking to my mates, I'm going to have a story for them. <laughs> yeah. You know, and that's what drove me because this yeah. is going to end. And, yeah. and, and, and then it just didn't end. It didn't end. <laughs> and it well, yeah, the, hard, the hardest part is uh, I'm a bit lazy and now I've got to keep coming up with stories. I've got to keep putting myself in um, situations and, and that's the trick. you got to keep putting yourself in uncomfortable situations that, uh, you know, be it a, a, a an interview with someone, you know, exciting and huge or big that I am in awe of and, and then, you know, punch my way out of the corner and I've, I've, I've got to keep doing that.
Yeah. Well, it seems like uh, what's really uncomfortable is you sitting down with a nobody podcaster and doing no, no, <laughs> you're doing, a legend. Doing a, yes, no, doing a two hour deep dive no, into your life. No, 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 no. This is this is great. This is awesome. No, it's <laughs> um, it's 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 great. Yeah, you know, and it, it's wonderful to see you here and yeah, our mate Joe Fowler and great Aussies over here doing so well. Which is you know, I, when I arrived in, I, I moved here in October two thousand and one, and went straight. You know, I arrived and the following day I started. I was straight on the show so working, good. and uh, and the following morning, and uh, and there was no the only Aussies that I would talk to and hang out with, who are all still my mates, uh, were bankers and brokers yeah. and um, stockbrokers, or you know, uh, and 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 they were all the Aussies over here. And then it wasn't until probably 08, 09 when the creatives started coming in. Mm. Yeah, you know, there were creatives there, don't get me wrong, but they were really flowing in mm. then, which was awesome. And mm. so it's, um, yeah, so I was, I'd be the lone guy. And um, yeah, I remember at my own engagement party when I got up and made a speech, just like in 2007, I looked around the crowd and I went, oh my goodness, I'm the only guy that's like a, like that that is in media at this whole show other than my bosses who were there and uh but it was like what the heck's going on you know the, the, yeah it, it's a um a, a funny existence when you were the you know the, the the first guy to come over from a you know a non-acting and a non-banking sort of area and be in new york mm. so I'm, I'm wrapped that guys like you guys are here are, 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 you know over here and when i say crushing it crushing it yeah, spiritually, you're, you're yeah. on the run. Like every, I'd always use the, the racing terminology. Every post's a winner, yeah. and you've got to wake up and go. Oh, what's my next adventure? And just keep putting, in, reinvesting in yourself for yeah. for the story. I mean, that's that's what I did. Yeah, great. Well, I, with that, <clears throat> with that in mind, the thing I love about New York is, um, I'm just with a great group of like amazing creative people. I wake up every day and I'm like, fuck yeah, let's do it. Let's good, go to the cafe. Good. Let's like yeah, hang yeah. out. Let's oh, let's talk yes. ideas. Let's work together. Awesome. Let's go out together. And it's amazing. You don't get that in common. You don't no, get that no, in Geelong. No, that's right. And you feel out of place. Yeah. And I didn't get it in, in 2001. Mine was Nur, the Pakistani guy who ran the Salt and oh, Pepper yeah, yeah, Diner. <laughs> Nur, great guy. Loved his Pakistani cricket, and he and I hit it off and he would get uh, he would get all my trials and tribulations <laughs> from the night before he, he, he I would I'd just be crying on his shoulder as he as I was eating naan bread at 10 30 a.m after and uh, and a curry I don't even know what what, what it was um I think you know oxtail I think it was an oxtail whatever an oxtail uh, tasted good I'm like is it really ox what it's is like it? it's whatever it yeah, might be rat yeah, <laughs> yeah, <it's laughs> and, no. and, and no was my uh creative outlet uh friend uh, back in then so uh, it's great that you have mates to do yeah. this, to, to to do this with. Yeah, it's come a long way, but you seem to manage okay yes. without without yep. that network. That's so right. Yeah, you yeah, built yeah. the network. Yeah. By the the, yeah, you just keep chatting, and yeah, yeah. It, it's uh, well, look, I, I was in radio, and I'd I'd meet other radio people, so you'd share radio stories, and then you'd be like, well, I'm not trying to. You know, everyone I'd go on radio conventions or, or big junkets where there'd be like you'd go to the Billboard Awards and there'd be uh, 50 radio stations in a massive room interviewing people and I'd sit down and uh, at my table uh, WPLJ New York and it's awesome and then you know they bring you people but you'd be out with all these people and everyone was a DJ during you know like spin records with the hope of moving to a morning show because they'd never send the morning show i'd be the only morning show representative but i wasn't trying to be a dj and i wasn't mm. trying to even be a host i, I wasn't trying my, i wanted my life to be the radio out there guy mm. and and that so uh even even when we would share stories they'd be like what you you go out every night and collect content and then bring it back in the next morning and i'm like yeah and then and Anyway, the, the one thing that I did, we did have similar when I would go on these trips and meet other radio people was uh, they would have dedicated stunt guys, which really was what my role in American morning radio was designed was for stunt guys. And I would, <laughs> my guys wanted me to do stunts and I'd squeeze them into probably one month a year where mm. I'd give them... The stunts. What, yeah. what are the stunts? All right. Um, well, we've seen the, the, the stunts <laughs> of over the Joe years. laughing in the corner? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, we have a long history. I have a long history of stunts that, again, I knew I had this incredible job where I was talking to massive people and, and 
but I also knew I'm in radio and I've, <laughs> I've got to give them some stunts. So it was kind of like, what was that old theory that they always talked about with, uh, I think Ben Affleck or Matt Damon came up with it, where you've got to give the, um, you've got to give the studio one big movie that they can, like in Ben Affleck's case, Armageddon, and they can sell that and it's going to cost them $200 million. I'm going to do that and that's, and then I'm going to go off and do something very small, you know, my independent one. So in my world was I would give them one stunt a year and then I would, uh, and with a few scattered in, in between, uh, and then I'd get to do my interviews every day. Uh, but look, some notable ones were... Uh, they had me dress up as Elmo, um, <laughs> head to toe Elmo, a very, you know, it's a fiberglass head and it's massive. And an Elmo suit was a Hessian suit. And I, uh, they had me do a triathlon through uh, New Jersey up a mountain, a, a hill in New Jersey, which was a like a highway thoroughfare. Video. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah. And uh, I, I would, um, and and that was through the whole radio show. It was epic. We, I mean, I was, I, I did it. I started it on a uh, kids BMX <laughs> and I dressed as Elmo uh, in West Orange. I think it was at the home of Queen Latifah, where she's from. Anyway, and then the, that was seven miles, and the next seven miles was so on a scooter. I rode seven miles on a kids BMX, kids BMX, which is incredibly difficult. How do you get paid yeah, for it, this? Yeah, yeah, yes. I don't, I don't know. And You're then like uh, the influencer before yeah, and influencer. Yeah, yeah, this is Mr. Beast stuff. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, and then the next seven miles was uh, on a on a scooter, uh, a, a kid scooter. I could only fit my foot on it, and that was up a hill and then down a hill. I actually fell off there, which was great drama <laughs> for for great rate because I had the uh, uh, Todd Pettengill, the the, the one of, you know, one of the head guys, the, the host of the show, behind me doing a, a broadcast, following me, and I had three police cars, uh, three in front and three behind. And the craziest thing about this, my, and my final seven miles was jogging. Um, so as I would go from county to county through New Jersey, the police, it was a thing of beauty. The police cars would all perfectly uh, move off as I would cross county lines. It was like Dukes of Hazard, which I show <laughs> that I love. You can't cross county lines. And then the police would veer off and then the next three would perfectly come in. And, and, and I'm like, and I'm just, I'm doing this. And I'm like, <laughs> what I'm, is I'm, going I'm, on I'm, I'm like, this is nuts. And I'm looking around, I'm like, traffic is destroyed. Like <laughs> that one day in North Jersey, imagine being so angry. I mean, it's what an asshole move from our station, but it was so big and people loved it. People were, were, were lining up down the street of roads, major roads, but we destroyed traffic. I, I, it was terrible. So and you're I, stuck in traffic. Yeah, you're yeah. waiting to get to work yeah. and some dude in a some fucking dude, Almo yeah. costume. Yeah, yeah. I, heard, I, I, heard, I, heard, I heard one one car crash and I looked I looked around and then a guy in front of me I had a mate in the support car in the front and he just said dude don't look back just keep going and I'm like I'm not looking back I, I heard it I heard a car crash and I, I just kept going and uh, uh, um, yeah so something like Elmo that was Imagine the Elmo explaining that to your insurance yeah, company yes yeah, 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 yeah. I saw this Elmo like person running through New Jersey uh, that was big um, I, I once got locked in a box uh, cardboard box. This was in honour of a, a Chinese delivery guy got locked in an elevator in the Bronx for uh, 72 hours and he, eat the food? he just ate the food <laughs> but um, to survive and then obviously there was a lot of stuff going on in that elevator when the police or fire, the fire department broke in and saved his life. So then they wanted to test how long I could last in a box mm -hmm. with uh, filled <laughs> with Chinese food. So they would fill that. Um, um, I lasted maybe a couple of hours. That was that was good. Is that yeah. it? That was it. Yeah, uh, they once Wait, covered, not eating the Chinese. Food? I didn't eat the Chinese food. Uh, yeah, it was. But the Chinese food was purposely left out over three nights or something. Oh, okay. So it stunk. And well, nice. anyway, um, uh, <laughs> uh, they covered me. They saw how many bottles of French's mustard could cover my body from head to toe. What is that number? Uh, out of curiosity. Uh, yeah, oh, I think it was like seventy-five bottles. Okay. And they covered me all. My my, my skin um, became yellow for a week. <laughs> I couldn't get it soaked into my pores. Um, they, I did another, another. Uh, I ran in honor of uh, Miley Cyrus, uh, Hannah Montana. I dressed up as Hannah Montana yeah. uh, in a massive ten inch, uh, you know, heels, and um, ran ten miles in those through New Jersey with fishnet. Um, stockings I looked amazing um, what other things I had a crush on Hannah Mont uh, oh, yeah. on, on Miley Cyrus when I was younger so I think if yep. I had ever seen you 
dressed up in that, yeah. that would have instantly destroyed that crush. Yes, so. it would have. Yes, you wouldn't want to see <laughs> me do that. So there were many stunts. Oh, the big one, which is now I'm, um, you know, uh, the biggest. Oh, well, one of the biggest. The Elmo was the, the yeah, is, is the biggest. But this one was crazy, and it was only. T- two weeks into my job and it was Halloween and um, the show and and, I arrived a month after September 11th so everything's on you know the the security alerts are going off the nation was getting like uh, they had an alert system where they would say we're high alert now you know uh, and in terms of uh, terrorism you know concerned about that and um, the President Bush would come out and say we're we're on orange alert Mm -hmm. anyway um on this uh, one morning, maybe the like the thirtieth of October, uh, they dressed me up as Monica Lewinsky, and um, uh, and it was a blue dress that Monica wore, or which was put in for evidence. Bought at Gap, so they put me in a blue dress. They put a red beret on me. Um, they had Exhibit A pointing at certain things on my body, and and I didn't want to. I mean, I'm like, this is gonna, this is the worst thing. I stand, and they put me in the PLJ van, which is like pink. Yeah, our radio station was like a sort of big female listening audience, so it was like pink and all these groovy colours on the van, and you know, and the intern drove me out to Chappaqua, and we were going to trick or treat uh, Bill and Hillary Clinton's house, <laughs> and. Um, <laughs> And we get out there first. We had a tip off. We knew that Bill uh, and Chappaqua at the time were probably you know top three you know uh, show in terms of listening audience in in, in this this the town of Chappaqua, which is mm-hmm. up Westchester, uh, suburban New York. And and uh, I go to the Starbucks first. And I, back then I had a backpack, which was an old mobile phone where it was set up where you had your headphones. And and, I'm, and I had a microphone too connected to it. So I'm interviewing people. There's Bill Clinton here. Anyone see Bill Clinton? Everyone's laughing at me, having a good time. Great. And I'm like, how is this even good radio? Because I am petrified here. <laughs> I'm like two weeks in. I'm, at that stage, I'm on a dodgy visa. I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to get... Yeah, mm. I get arrested. I'm cooked. Yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm 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 back selling caravans in in Australia or being an accountant again. And I'm like, what is going on? And uh, get back in the PLJ van, and we're driving down the street, and the police come and 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 pull us over. And I'm like, oh no. And uh, he 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 pulls up on the side, which I thought was uh, all right. He can't. He's not going to. Yeah, he's not behind us. He pulls up on the side, and it was the sheriff. He goes, oh, I'm the sheriff of the town here. Um, yeah, or the police chief or whatever. I'm the boss of this town. And I'm like, all right, sir, yeah, how you doing? And I'm dressed as Monica, you know, with the wig and everything, you know, going on. And and uh, he goes, um, I've been listening this morning. And I went, oh, no, this is not going to be good. He goes, you're looking for the Clintons? And I went, yeah, yeah, yep, yep. He goes, tell you what, let me show you where they live. And I went... I went, what? What the, This is terrible. The local police chief's going to show me where I'm going to be doing it. He goes, yeah, follow me. He goes, I said, why are you doing it? He goes, oh, it's a, he goes it's been pretty funny on the radio. <laughs> um, and I went, oh, jeez. All right, so we follow the police guy and he takes us into their courtyard. I get to the Clinton's house uh, and, and it's like a cul-de-sac, as they would call mm-hmm. it. And uh, I... Um, uh, uh, I get out of the car and I'm live on air and two Secret Service guys meet me on the front strip and they say, if you step onto the thing, you're done. Uh, and What's done uh, then? Cook, you just They just said, I imagine they would arrest me or, okay. you know, um, <laughs> but you do whatever you want on the road. And I did my piece and said, good. And, and I saw a car come out, exit, and I'm like, all right. Well, if that – tinted windows, couldn't see it there. And I'm like, what a – Prick, I am, you know, doing this. Um, and uh, and did that bit and got in my van and went back to the city. Uh, you know, felt I got a, I got away with it, but but that, 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 that I've given you a bit on my stunts, and there's there's a lot more where that came from, but yeah, I had to do those things to keep me going on the show, but that was only in two weeks into the gig. That's wild, yeah. So, <laughs> do you ever reflect back? And go, how the fuck did this happen? No, no, I'm, I'm doing that right now. <laughs> yeah, as you're tapping into my mind. Um, like, yeah, like there, there were so many moments where it should have all went wrong. Yeah, and, and as, as I said before, I when I got arrived in October 01, I, it had been a year, a year, 
13 months that I'd been associated with the show and mm-hmm. calling in and trying to get a full-time job. And there was no reason for them to hire me by any means. And um, I, I get over and then I'm like, all right, I need to keep this job somehow. Yeah. Uh, and that, and, and, and I didn't know what I was doing. I had no broadcasting experience. I didn't know how a show worked. I didn't know timing. And I, I knew that I had to be subservient to the superstars, guys that are making, you know, that I was on with that were making millions a year. I knew that. Um, but I, I still had to be strong enough to push in at the right time. It's mm-hmm. a real balancing act. And, I, and, and as you know, I, I love to talk and love to have a chat. So I had to talk in headlines more and you got to make it quicker and snappier all that stuff I was trying to figure out and and I through that time I just, I just kept going and 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 doing it for the story and hoping things would pan you know things would go my way and if 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 it got to a year in and I lost the job and they said you're cooked you're done uh, I'd have a year of experience on New York radio and that was sort of all, a long I, was, way. all I was living for and and just living for creating that audio for the next day and mm. so that's all i was thinking which now that i look about look back on it after you ask me that it's like that's uh, uh, it was very much in the moment and mm. knowing there were some things down the road like my goals it was october 01 i'm a massive olympics fan how i got the job was through the sydney olympics so i knew the salt lake city olympics were coming up so that was my goal i had like these big beachhead moments scattered throughout the, the following year that if I could make that, then that would be a win for me. Mm-hmm. So that's how I sort of treat it. And then treated, you know, the rest of my life up until now. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Was it, uh, were you very strategic about it? It sounds like you kind of were, but yeah. then also it seems, sounds very scattered at the same yeah, time. Yeah. <laughs> no, very, <laughs> hard, yeah, to, it's, hard to pin down. Yeah, look, I think there was strategic in, in, yeah, I, no, I had, I had to be, I had, like, I had to get through to those, those uh, Olympics. So I knew that was my skill that I brought to them was being able to drop into somewhere, something like an Olympics with no contacts, nothing, and and weave uh, three weeks of um, interviews and storylines and running storylines for myself, like my own mini reality show, uh, all audio, all radio through that whole Olympics, and that's what I knew I was, I could do early on in, in, in my game. I could go mm-hmm. in there and create stuff and, and, and create some big moments just by hustling. And, and, and so there was strategy to get to that stage. And like off the back of the, off the back of the Olymp- Olympics, it was the Grammys two nights later. And then I would do the Grammys and, and then would report live. Oh, I didn't even go to sleep that night. And I remember I was in the, you know, um, I, I was in that, the car park, an empty car park uh, outside the Grammys, interviewing a, a great, you might know him, a t- a T-Bone Burnett with his you know, Grammy sitting there and it was an empty car park and I'm interviewing him and then I knew I'm leaving him and I'm going to the Mondrian um, on Sunset because there's a little red carpet there for a record label party and I made it there in time and then you Hefner walks in <laughs> and uh, I'm interviewing him and and I'm you know interviewing Paul Stanley from Kiss you know, uh, uh, all these people and then I'm then I'm trying to get to the bar because I can see John Stewart and I wanted to wish him all the best for his show but I couldn't get to him because of Colin Farrell was in front of me <laughs> like so I knew these big events were rolling rolling and I was probably strategic in picking them. And again, it gets back to squeeze as many of these events in before it all fell over. But then it sort of turned into my strength of going to these events and creating funny moments out of them. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. So, so why why do you think they took a chance on you? Or we'll go all the way back to the start. Yeah. Genuinely, why? Uh, all right. So <clears throat> the, look, the, the, the story goes, I walked, I, I was over for a wedding uh, this is in 2000, August 2000. And, you know, at the time I was living in Sydney, I w- I'd, I'd had four years of accounting under my belt um, in London and moved back to Sydney. Couldn't get an accounting job because everyone was sort of like a hiring freeze until after the Sydney Olympics. Mm-hmm. And I, I'd moved to live in Sydney for the Olympics. Mm-hmm. and um, But I was running out of money. and But I had this wedding in New York already paid for. And it, so I came over for the wedding for my childhood best mates and we had a great time and everyone was sort of leaving and I'm like well I've got to make these last few days work for me because I'm 
you know, I'm still want to be in the entertainment industry somehow. The whole goal of 2000 was to somehow get in, break in, doing something, being a writer or yeah, actor or something. I didn't, I, but I had no idea how to do any of those things or how how you know um how to how to get into any of that. But the one idea I, I had was I always loved radio call-in guys. I loved the uh, the poor man that would call into Eddie Maguire's grill team <laughs> on Triple M. Um, this guy I thought this, this guy's crazy, you know. And uh, you know he always regaled them with these stories every Saturday morning uh, in the early nineties. Anyway, I um I said that sounds like a good job. I could do that for the Olympics because NBC aren't going to put me on TV. So maybe I could ring up uh, stations and I printed out this is the internet was in its infancy and i printed out a list of the you know top 20 new york radio stations and number one was howard stern i sat down one day and i had a made a got a buddy of mine made a demo tape that was terrible you know um and my buddy was an electrician but he was like a entertainment yoda to everyone in bondi you know you know those guys like it was unbelievable like he did he, he, he got it he had actresses sitting in his living room you know crying on his shoulder i'm like this guy's an electrician what the <laughs> fuck how, how, is, how is he know anything about acting but they he was a yoda of entertainment somehow anyway he helped me make a demo tape brought the demo tape with me over and i get the list and i the first person i ring is howard stern he's the only radio guy you know the i knew i rang him and they uh how'd you find his number no i, I just rang the switchboard yeah oh. like sorry i'm not ringing him i rang the switchboard and um you know and as you can tell back then a lot of idiots and crazy and mad people would call radio station um you know uh, you know, uh, receptionist. So um, she, I started talking and she hung up on me straight away. I went, all right. So I rang the second one. Everyone hung up on me. And this one receptionist, I begged her. I said, like, this is the last station I'm going to call. Please put me through to, just, just put me through to someone's voicemail. And she put me through to, and I didn't know executive producers. I didn't know how shows were set up. And, but she put me through to the executive producer of the Scott and Todd show on a station called WPLJ. And I left the message and- What was the message? At, well, this is the best part. The greeting on the voicemail was Steve Irwin. <laughs> so <laughs> I went, oh, this is amazing. Steve Irwin's the- um, yeah, This is yeah, Steve Irwin's the greeter um, to my message. And I left and I said, well, if they love Steve Irwin, I've got to really hand this one. I, uh, I was trying to go in there and be a sophisticated, the new Australian, <laughs> the Sydney Olympics Australian, where I wasn't going to you know, pour on the crocodile Dundee. But when I heard Steve Irwin, I said, ah, screw it. I'm going all in on this one. And this is your <laughs> face. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the rest yeah, of yeah, your yeah, life. Yeah, yeah. And I just went, g'day, mate. Yeah, I'm out here with the kangaroos and the kookaburras. And uh, <laughs> I just poured on. But I'm, I'm living on Bondi Beach. I'm right near the beach volleyball courts. You know, um, love to come in and be you talk to you about uh, pitch you my idea of being your Sydney Olympics correspondent and I hung up and a minute later phone rang me back I'm staying at a mate's apartment you know no cell phones and you know, might have had a pager or something and he called me back and said all right come in tomorrow morning um uh, 8 a.m and I went all right awesome thank you and I went I went straight to Banana Republic and bought a new <laughs> pair of pants, you know, a, 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 a polo shirt, and uh, and it was a 100-degree day the following I remember the night before in Kinko's, I said, oh, I better write them a nice pitch. And I was in there three hours writing up a pitch and um, printed it off all nice. I had my demo tape, my pitch, and my new Banana Republic pants the following morning. It's like 100 degrees, you know, uh, Fahrenheit, which is Aussie terms, what's that, about 38 degrees yeah, Celsius. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah. so hot, mid-August, and I'm walking across town from Murray. Hill over um, and I'm like I'm getting to the state I'm like holy shit this station this I, I didn't think they were big I didn't know anything about them I didn't know at the time that Disney owned them Disney ABC owned them at the time and I'm like wow they're above Madison Square Garden oh they might be something and um I, I go up, uh, but I'm drenched. I'm sweat. I've got my pitch in my pocket folded up. Um, and I go in and I get straight into the executive producer's office, sit down with him, a guy called Bruce Goldberg. And uh, he, he, he grabs my tape. He puts the, the tape in, the, um, in the, his deck and hits play. And uh, uh, after 30 seconds, he pulled the tape out and he dropped it in the trash can. And I just went, ooh, that, that's not good. I mean, it was, <laughs> and it was a terrible, I mean, it was, oh, it was terrible. And he, it was great dramatic effect that he had on me. And, uh, and I'm like, wow, this guy's tough, this, this executive producer. Like, wow. And he's quite gruff to me. And then I pulled, he goes, what else you got? I said, I had a pitch, you know, a one page here, here. And I gave him that, you know, to be his, the pitch was to be their Sydney Olympics correspondent, you know, where I'd, 
do interviews and call-ins and whatever. And I handed that to him and it was drenched. And he picked it up by the corner and he dropped that in the bin without even reading it. And I said, oh, I'm screwed here. Anyway, he, uh, he said, come with me sit on that couch and I waited for like half an hour interns were coming out and talking to me you know all going good and then he called me in I went into a radio studio headphones he said put those headphones on I put them on and there's people around me and you know as a young Aussie here you, you're trying to chat to people a bit of small talk and no one would talk to me no one would look at me and uh, and I just sat here and there's probably six seven people all bustling this bustling studio um, here and then I see the on-air light go on and I hear the Olympic music playing. I'm like, oh, that's cool. I love that Olympic music. You know, the big... I'm like, and then I hear this beautiful voice and I have to look around, you know, saying we've been scanning the universe. We've been interviewing people from all over the world to be our Olympics correspondent. I'm like... I was, got pissed off then because I'm like, they've just stolen my idea, (laughs) made it their own, which is a beautiful radio trick. And, uh, and... he uh, and these two guys, Scott and Todd, welcomed me to the show. We have one of our guys. We're doing a, a job interview right now for him. Um, so what do you want to do? I said, oh, I want to go to, you know, I knew pretty quickly they weren't a sports station. They weren't politics radio or whatever. This was just a comedy Entertainment, show. Yeah. Entertainment. I said, I'm going to go tell you who's having sex with who <laughs> in the <laughs> Athletes Village. I was just on fire. I was just reeling off lines and um, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And uh and it, it got to the uh, end of the chat and they said, they looked at each other and they said, uh, and they looked at me and said, do you have any experience in, in broadcasting? I went, no. Any experience in TV? No. Any experience in radio? No. And they looked at each other and they, they went, you're hired. <laughs> you're now our Sydney Olympics correspondent. And, uh, and that was the moment where I went, oh my gosh, something, I, I, I mean, I was just su- such in a zone that I, I was just on fire. And, uh, and then they, everyone left and I walked outside and the producer goes, oh, we'll pay you $50 a phone call. And I went, yeah, yeah, whatever. Yeah, great. Yeah, 50 bucks <laughs> a phone that, call. Is that cheap? That, yeah, that's nothing. <laughs> that's, that's, but I'll, yeah, at least I made it money. I got some money out of it. And, um, and then I flew back to – I was living in Bondi at the time and for the next three weeks I called in every day. And I had interviews. I would go out and I, I love Dave Letterman's um, interviews that he used to do and – man on the street stuff and mm-hmm. I, I went out and started interviewing weird Australians and the biggest hit interview was interviewing one of those wilderness koala bears um, I, I couldn't find anyone to interview this one day and I, I saw this guy having a smoker with his koala bear hat off and I just started interviewing him about what it takes to be a you know a charity <laughs> you know a wilderness koala society bear. koala bear and he took it so seriously I went this guy's gold and I took that <laughs> interview and I played it you know on my like my fourth day just as I thought my whole you know the whole time during that I'm like they're gonna fire me because I really had no idea you know the night before on the first Wednesday of the Olympics like I'd already been on the previous week leading up to the Olympics the second week. Yeah, and this is live, 7.30 a.m., primetime, New York City radio, uh, and I'm, they're giving me 10 minutes. I'm like, this is crazy. And, and, I, and, I, and, I, and the previous night I was in the Holland Heineken house that I'd hustled my way into, and I was probably 10 Heinekens, dr- you know, hammered. I was, I was hammered. I had he- Dutch girls on the phone talking to them, and um, I thought, I'm going to get fired, you know. The next day, the producer said that wasn't your good performance. I hope you go better the next night. Um, and I played the um, uh, played this koala bear, and it was just a huge hit. And that, that they just kept playing and playing. You know, why are you dressed as a koala bear? Was my opening line to this guy. And you can ima- you know, imagine. Anyway, um, so that that kicked it all off. And of course, you know, as, as we all know in this game, you know, and especially in New York, they. There's, there's, the Olympics finished and I'd become this character, Brad Blanks, and uh, a mate of mine whose wedding it was, who was living in New York, Cameron, my, my good mate, he was going out uh, in Wall Street bars and whatever, and people were asking him if I if, if he was me. Yeah, and he, right. he's like, dude, people are talking about this guy. You know, the, the, the people are coming in from New Jersey, driving in and listening to this show and hearing you do these crazy things Wait, from so Sydney. Hold on, take a step back then. Yeah. So people have, it was like geographically locked. So people had to drive into a certain oh, no, area. No, 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 driving, you know, just commuters. Oh, okay, sorry, right. morning radio. 
radio. People are going no, no, into no, no. the spot no, no, just no, to no. Commuter, look. commuters drive because no one in Manhattan really listened to the radio. It was all well taxi drivers. Yeah, all, but, right. but, but, but yeah, it was all New all Jersey, other boroughs. yeah, Connecticut, and you know Long Island. All listening, to, you know, uh, we're listening to this. M- me and he, he yeah, you know, the the station and hearing this. You know, crazy drunk Australian, pretty much on the air. And uh, my mate Cameron said, "You got to get over here. You got to figure this out." And it took me like pitching ideas. And the, the, starting in January, uh, Outback Survivor was big, and I became their Survivor correspondent. While I, I went back to accounting, so I'm an accountant by day, calling into New York radio by <laughs> night. And I'm like, "Geez!" And then um, they. And, and, but then I, that's when I started forming my plans and my first thing that I could offer them because they didn't need me because I'm just lucky that we had the Olympics and then we had Outback Survivor and I pinned myself to that show through those two events and it got to – and then I said, well, I've got to do something for me. I, I loved uh, – I loved like the Melbourne Cup and horse racing and whatever. So I said, I always wanted to go to the Kentucky Derby. So I said, I'll cover the Kentucky Derby for you. And I'll also, and I love movies. So I'll cover the Cannes Film Festival. As long as you can get me press credentials, I'll pay my own way. And Bruce, the executive producer said, sold. Yeah, great. So I came over at the end of April and went off to the Kentucky Derby and lived in this old woman's basement because <laughs> I met her granddaughter <laughs> in Antigua and the, you know, a few years before at the cricket, which is another story. And and, uh, and she said, yeah, whenever you go to uh, Louisville, Kentucky, stay in my grandmother's place. She's got a big, big, uh, big house. So I slept in her basement and I'd be live from the basement living in an old lady's house <laughs> reporting on the Kentucky Derby. And, and you can – people – but people couldn't understand it. Who the fuck is this guy living in a woman's basement during the, you know, leading up to the, the Kentucky Derby? And no one had ever on a mainstream morning show reported on the Kentucky Derby. You know, yeah, like that's normally not even, doesn't even make sport, sports. You know, like it's maybe on ESPN they show the ending of it. But here I am interviewing stable hands, you know, and um, like and giving tips on, on a horse race and interviewing the drunks and whatever. And, uh, and they found that entertaining and and then the following week i got on a plane and uh, it helped when i tipped the winner though i tipped the winner at yeah. 10 to 1 so a lot of people made money out of that and then the following week i went to Cannes film festival and re- you know re- reported from there so i had this i was creating this sense of adventure again that i you know i didn't know if they're going to hire me and eventually i moved to london went back to being an accountant and in october um uh you know, they, they hired me before September 11 happened and then September 11 happened and I couldn't get a hold of them for a month. Obviously, mm-hmm. you know, that, that would have been it. And uh, mid-October, they rang me back and said, no, no, we still want you. We've obviously, you know, things have gone crazy here, sadly, but we still want you. Can you be here next week? And I flew over October 20 and, uh, and I was on that show for another nine years wow. every morning. Yeah, <clears throat> like, you know, and uh, yeah, it was, it was great, awesome. Wow. So, so with all that in mind, what do you think? If somebody's listening to this now, what are the lessons to take from that experience? Yeah. Uh, look, you, I, I think the big thing is, I think you got to be easy to work with. You got to be, you know, you've, you've got to be good company. You know, I know works work, and not everyone's good company in work, but uh, you got to quickly fit into what their goals are, and 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 I, which I did for them, but. When that show finished at 10 a.m., I, I was I was going out and figuring out what my goals were and how can I how can I work for myself that can then fit into what they want me to do on that morning show. Mm. Um, what makes you know, someone easy to work with? Uh, well, from your experience, look, I, I, if I had been a, a an asshole or a real wanker, um, I, they. They they would have got rid of me straight away. I I, yeah. I had to you know and, and and we're in as everyone knows you're in New York you're in entertainment you're working with a lot of people who Big egos. Um, you know, egos and you know you've got to stroke the egos but you don't want to you're not kissing ass so yeah. you know you, you you've got to make the egos challenge them you got to yeah. you know you, but it's a fine you, line yeah and and look everything I ever did to get that job and to stay in the job was. Um, uh, I gift wrapped. I, I, I made everything so easy that that it it was it was perfectly gift wrapped. If I gave them an interview, I would edit it as much as I could and leave a bit of fat on it. Give it to the executive producer, and and he would then edit it how he would want it. But it, you'd always just make things Go a just little a, bit, yeah, a little bit above and beyond. That's right. Or, yeah. or and and I think you know that 
helps. Go the extra dis- distance. Like if you're working in an office and you walk into the dish room and there's shit everywhere, clean the dishes up. You know, like mm. <laughs> that's just, that might be an old school thing, but the, these little one percenters were always uh, helping me. But I, I think it's more important to be, uh, if you're working in a team environment, you've got to be good company. Mm. You, as, you know, you still got to get you have your own goals, but I, I think being a good person will, will win out in the end. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So with that in mind, I want to un- get a bit more of an understanding of the role of a sidekick because you mentioned that as <laughs> that was your role in this and yeah. you've made a, it seems like you've made a career from being the sidekick. Yeah, so, yeah. That's, that's so, right. So yeah. what is the, what, what is what makes a good sidekick? What made you a good sidekick in that world? And how can somebody that's maybe coming up in a difficult world like film or media yeah. play a role like that yeah. effectively? Oh yeah, it's a good role. I, I think it's a great role because again, you're working with, you're working with, you know, if, if you get onto the right show or be it in, in whatever profession you're in, you're working with legends and you've got to be able to, you, 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 like I said before, you've got to be, a little have a little bit of arrogance to get yourself forward, but you got to play to their egos and you mm. got to be kind to their feelings and how they're going. They're the big stars. What's that, an example? It, uh, an example of a big star, like like us uh, being kind of uh, a big star. No, no. Uh, um, you 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 want to set them up to look good. Yeah. So in my case, it was you know I was never going to be the punchline guy because they had the funniest punchline guy in radio mm. working there. They had. Yeah, you know, the best, the legend, it was Scott Shannon, a legend of American radio who invented the, the zoo format. Uh, and zoo you know, format? the zoo format where you have like a straight guy, you have the funny guy, uh, okay. you have, um, you know, uh, the traffic guy who drinks too much beer. <laughs> you have the, uh, the straight news lady who whips the guys into shape when they're being out of line. You have it's the anchor man, basically. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is the, yes. Yeah, very much. It's, um, and then in, in my case, you would, you know, the stunt guy or the junior, they would call my role was usually the junior producer would do what I would do. Uh, but, but I think you've got to, you can never supersede the stars of the show. I think that's mm. that's important. And obviously, yeah, history's been littered with people that have come in where the sidekicks always thought they were better than the stars, and uh, and and then blown themselves up and never been able to get another job like that again. Except for James Harden. Um, <laughs> uh, James, Harden, yes, well, he was at Houston, and and he was the, was he the sidekick to? He was the sidekick to uh, uh, what's his name? Um, uh, the guy that went Curry. to the, was it Curry? Uh, no, Clippers. no, who did he play for? Houston Rockets first. Yeah, he played and for Houston. What? Okay, so that's right. Okay, so okay, yeah, okay, so yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then he, uh, and then oh, he went sorry, off to Houston. Sorry, okay, so first. Sorry, you're right. Yes, yep. Yeah. Westbrook, yeah, Westbrook. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, so you, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, uh, look, and people have blown themselves up with the, uh, by always leaving something that was great. And, and look, I think you, uh, yeah, I think being good, being good, look, you still got to put, transplant your mind into being, in, in my case, it was a, there was a lot of voices going on. Mm. I knew who the big the big dogs were. Um, you know, I sat next to Patty Steele, who's awesome, and she had to throw her lines in. I always knew my place, but I would, you know, when it was my segment, I still had to drive mm. that segment. They yeah. weren't, you know, I learned that very quickly because I thought they had to drive it, but when it was the Brad Blank segment, I had to drive that and set them up to look good in it. My, my role was as a sidekick was making the hosts – Funnier. I hope I did that, you know, and yeah. and and gave them plenty to chew on in mm. that moment. Because I mean, more, you know, radio is such a you know improv game. You don't know where it's going to go. Well, you don't know where you know they could be having a bad day, and there were many times that I was having a bad day, and I was getting I would get killed. And then that mm. first year, it was it was tough. I, I'd be I was like living in. A, I'd go home and be in a fetal position in the corner, going, <laughs> "What am I doing? I'm getting destroyed here." But I was learning the craft of radio on air in New York city, which is absurd. Yeah. Yeah. It is absurd. So how did you, how did you juggle surviving in such an expensive city like New York when you're getting paid like yeah. probably pittance yes. yeah. and cause that's, that's something that I'm yeah. noticing is challenging. Like you want to be, you know, there are certain things you can be doing that are probably going to make the oh. best long-term yeah. outcomes for you. But then at the same time, you're like, how the fuck do I survive oh, here? It's, no, no, look, it's, it's crazy. At this stage, I was 27 years of age when I'm in that. And I'm like, I think back now and I'm like, 
I would not want my children to be 27 <laughs> years of age doing a job for, for that you're spending all, all your money, you're not saving anything, you're not moving your life forward, which is silly for me to say that because at the time I was doing it, I, I thought I was moving my life forward. Forward. But it seems so, like you were. Yeah, I was Ment- mentally and you everything were. I was doing. I was, <laughs> but it, I, I look at it and think, "What an idiot! Why did I do that?" And it worked. Don't get me wrong, but it's like, you know, uh, and you hear these these origin stories in a, in a lot of people, but it, it, you, that, that have gone on and done well. Because how how did I survive in, in, in New York? And look, I. I I got one little contract and then that rolled into the next contract and I got my phone for free from a, 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 com- a company and then I got, I was, um, I, then I got uh, two weeks a hotel across the street from Madison Square Garden. The Hotel Pennsylvania said, well, we'll give you two weeks if you want to, you know, um, stay here as long as you mention us on the radio. So I would say Scott and Todd would go, Brad Blanks brought to you by the newly refurbished and renovated Hotel Pennsylvania. And they were happy to yeah. do that for you just for they a place were, to yeah, live? They, which is crazy because they were really they happy. Because they get paid for yeah, that. Yes. That's the whole business. But you know, just get free that, That's right. <laughs> Don't worry. That's a great question because I still to this day, there are a lot of moments like that where someone was signing off that means that someone wanted me to be there. Because just, just for the sake of liking yeah, you. Yeah, you like it, which was great. And, and the, the product must have been working but I think Scott and Todd saw some great comedy in having this guy stay in the hotel across the street (laughs) which they weren't that fond of but I'm like this is a free bed anyway I end up staying in that hotel for six years Um, so yeah so yeah, a mate of mine, a mate of mine called Cheezel, who's uh, from Mildura, from Mildura, <laughs> was with me at the time when I got in there for two weeks, and he was stay, he stayed with me. And he goes, he goes, Blanksy, it, these deals don't end. I said, What do you mean? He goes, You might think this is two weeks. This is going to go for years. <laughs> I said, No. He goes, Dude, once you live somewhere, it's very hard to kick someone out if you're doing everything right, and all you have to do is mention them on the radio, and. Uh, yeah, so I continued to mention them on the radio from 2002 until three months into my marriage where I, they finally rang me up and said, um, Brad, aren't you married? And I went, yeah. And they said, well, what, why are you still got the hotel? I said, oh, I sort of use it as a day spa, which I was. I was, I was just finishing the – it was literally across the street from Madison Square Garden. They've torn the hotel down now. It's an empty lot there. And uh, I would I would work on the 17th floor of two Penn Plaza. I'd go down and I'd sleep – um, and live on the 17th floor of the Hotel Pennsylvania. But into my marriage, I would go and nap there every day, which was awesome. So it's like having a, a, a you know, I was pr- felt privileged to have a, a before, then I'd go home to my house with my <laughs> wife. Um, but six years, uh, great fun. And, and, and uh, but the aspect of that was I was able to, um, I was able to patchwork my money, you know, mm. and, and, and it was in, in the O's. Radio was still vibrant. There was still a lot of cash going through that media. And I was able to get sponsorships and endorsements and the phone company sponsored me. And But all my money was just going back into my adventures. And I, I would, you know, I'd go and cover a pumpkin festival in Ohio. And I'm like, all right, I'm going to go and do that, but I'm going to film it. I'm going to make a documentary on that for myself. But I'm also going to report in, live every morning with the weird and wonderful thing. Yeah, you know, and there were moments where Scott and Todd going, why the fuck would he go to a pumpkin festival? You know, <laughs> um, or I always wanted to see Mike Tyson fight in the flesh. So I I remember this one thing, he was fighting Lennox Lewis in Memphis and it was June. Uh, I'd been there, you know, I'd been on the air with them for nine months, but I knew I was pissing them off or, or pissing Scott off, the older, the, the old, yeah, the, the legend. I knew I wasn't perfect because he's a perfectionist and my, you know, I wasn't a perfect broadcaster. And, and I, on a Monday morning, I said, all right, guys, I'm going to uh, Tyson Law. I'm going to Memphis today. I'm going to cover this. Yeah. And that's no one, they never sent me anywhere. I'd go in and say, this is what I'm doing. Uh, and, you know, hopefully I'll call in. I said to him, and he goes, well, we're, f- we're 55% females and women hate boxing. Scott said this to me. And uh, I went, all right, no worries. Uh, don't worry about it. Todd was a bit more, all right, I'll set you off a friend to stay with. And he, he actually set me up with a friend to stay with. I arrive, I stay with this friend of his. I turn up, the friend, the poor guy, is a, he just got out of jail. Oh, he shit. was a chronic alcoholic and his lawn wasn't mowed. So... I got there and I sat with him on a couch and drank vodkas on the first day. Oh, shit. Anyway, but I became a part of the press contingent for the Tyson Lewis fight. 
it was the biggest story in America that week, and it was a massive celebrity meet sports in this crazy location. You know, Justin Timberlake was from uh, just down the road there, and it, it, he was going, and it was awesome. Every celebrity, and Cameron Diaz was going, Drew Barrymore was going. It was just this huge event. And then the following morning, Scott and Todd called me, and Scott – Oh man, we got Brad Blanks at the box. I'm like, dude, yesterday you were going to fire me for going to this, but yeah, you know, it's just I knew where the big moments were, so I, was, I kept putting them up. So doing trips like that, you know, I could go out there and sell to sponsors to back mm. as well. So there were many ways to make money. That was a great trip though, because on that final night of, um, I met Justin Timberlake drinking beers with him and his mother before the fight. <laughs> I um, was hang- that whole week. I was hanging out with Dave Chappelle because he, he was there for uh, the Jay Leno show. Um, you know, I, 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 I drank a beer with John Daly. When I say drank a beer, you know, chatting, introduce, you know, you, you introduce him to the people, and they become part of your group. Mm. So if you if you want to have some a famous person talk to you, you bring them into a group and introduce them all. They can't really walk away then. Um, <laughs> and I remember I pulled uh, David Hasselhoff walked past. I'm with the group, I, and and I just said, "Oh, there's David Hasselhoff," and I realized his pants were tucked into his sock so I ran up to him and and bent over and pulled his pulled his pants out of his sock and security jumped on me and they pulled me away and I said no no his pants were in his sock and Hasselhoff goes oh thanks man said, oh, thanks guys no, no worries all right good <laughs> and uh so I had these great moments that I was just relaying back to radio um uh yeah the, the following morning so were you um, filming by yourself or did you have a film person with you no uh, look I, I had no film it was all radio it was audio uh, but was, you said you were filming documentaries oh, oh, sorry, and the, stuff, the, the so. documentary I took so yeah so I would patchwork stuff like that where like, your own that was camera for, and uh, no I'd take um, whenever I'm feeling I'd take someone with me oh, okay. uh, um, so you couldn't do it all by yourself no, no no in terms of filming no um, but, but radio I was a one man one man crew yeah sure Damn. There's, so, so what, what's, uh, there's a few, th- there's so many different spots I want to go down with this, but like, um, you mentioned a little while ago, interviewing people on the street. How, what, how did you successfully interview people on the street? What were kind of the techniques around that? Uh, um, it, just the man on the street stuff. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. That was, uh, which is funny now seeing it cause it's such a huge it's a thing now. It's a th- huge thing. And, yeah. um, back then it was not a thing. And, uh, um, and this is even, you know, the, the next, the biggest one was, um, uh, Billy on the street. Right. And that was like the late O's, but I was going out in the early O's. Out. Mm-hmm. I just knew I could, if I had no, no radio segment that day, I could wake up at five 30 in the morning and walk out to Madison square garden. And, and I could buy the New York post, see what was on the front page, know what the biggest story was in America or USA today. Uh, and uh, newspapers, and then go, all right, bang. I, like, Friends finale was last night. I'm going to ask uh, people around Madison Square Garden. And at that time in the morning, you would get some interesting <laughs> folks, but you'd go up, you'd get the courage up. I got a real good sense of um, pitting, seeing someone and visually going, they're going to be great radio, yeah. which is which is crazy to think. And, so, and, and I my... My radar for good radio and a good interview was was pretty good, and uh, I, I'd honed that. And I'd go up, and I would just unearth these characters who all had an opinion uh, about anything that, that I that I wanted. I mean, of course, the best thing I wasn't always doing it pre-show, but um, but you know, you'd go out on a, at four p.m. the the previous day, and and then you, in terms of tactics, you'd have to be confident. Could I please interview you? I'm on this. You'd give you, you know, I'm on this radio station. I'm doing a segment on. Now, the funny thing is, because of my accent, everyone thought I was doing it for Australian radio. Oh, so yeah, people, yeah. people had no worries about that anyone would hear them or be yeah, embarrassed. And then the biggest yeah, radio yeah, station yeah, in New York. That's right. So I always like thought, did they, little did they know that I'd be, um, yeah, but I'd get some great, you know, I, I, one of my bits was turning people into famous movie reviewers and I, I'd have one guy turn around and said, I'm going to give you, um, I'm, I'm going to give this movie, I'm gonna, I give that movie three thumbs up and I said, you only have two thumbs and he said, he'd say, <laughs> he'd say, I'll find another one. Like, he, he just, and then, or another woman, I, it was New Year's resolutions and uh, I, I, I go up to her and she had a thick Russian accent and I interviewed her. I said, what's your New Year's resolution? And uh, she goes, uh, to, to, to give up smoking. I said, 
I said to her, I go, yeah, but you're smoking right now. And she goes, God bless America. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and, I, and so I've been I mean, unearthing these magic moments that I would just, and then put on radio, you know, minutes later. So that sort of quick turnaround was, was very addictive. But look, we've, Man on the street stuff. I don't do it anymore, and I mean it's something. It's probably I'd love time to, to start doing yeah, it. This start, is a moment yeah, in time is, where it's it. the yeah. resurgence. You yeah, crush yeah, that. Yeah. That's a good medium it, to start yeah, working in. It is. It is. It is. A get up and just you know and and look. It was all. It's all about setting up the characters to tell their own stories if they want to go. You know, get themselves into trouble. So be it. <laughs> but um, but uh, no, no. It, it was awesome. Yeah, yeah, love it. Just quickly though, I want to talk to you about a taboo but very important topic, sperm health. I bet you didn't think I was going there. One day I want to have kids and like any future parent, I want to give them the best shot at a healthy life. But let's face it, we're at a war every day with our health in this modern world. Chemicals, microplastics and artificial environments are wreaking havoc on our internal systems at every turn. And if you know me, you know I'm obsessed with health and the health of my swimmers have been on my mind for a number of years. That's why we've partnered with Legacy, who are changing the game in at-home sperm testing and freezing in the US. Did you know that globally, sperm counts have dropped by 50% in the last 40 years? Let that sink in for one moment. This is not just a fertility problem as well, because low sperm quality has been linked to a high risk of testicular cancer, heart disease, diabetes, and even early death. And on top of that, your sperm quality begins to decline around age 30 and by your 40s, the risk of infertility and having a chance of a child with neurological disorder begins to go up. So testing and freezing now may be the best decision I make for my future family and potentially you too. So Legacy makes it easy. They send the kit straight to your door. You do the business in the comfort of your own home and in 48 hours, the results are on your phone. Plus, you can freeze your sample at two secure locations for peace of mind. So if you're like me and you want to be proactive with your future, as well as support the podcast, head over to givelegacy.com and use the code TOT at checkout for 10% off. That's givelegacy.com using the code TOT for 10% off. Thanks for listening. Now back to the podcast. A lot of the work you do centers around comedy. Um, what would you say if you, someone's listening and they want to get into more of like the comedic world? What what, do you, what are your basis of understanding around comedy? Yeah, yeah. Someone called called me. You are a conduit for comedy, and I went. <laughs> no, I like that. Yeah, that's that's um, good. Yeah, I, I I always wanted to be a great setup guy to make you know to to get the person I'm talking to to be funny and to be funnier. And uh, I learned that was, I, I, I always thought that was a, a, a great way to be as long as everyone, as long as everyone's having a good time. Um, but well, look, what are the tracks now? Like what, what's the tack now? I, I was never going to be a stand up um, that, that wasn't in me, uh, but I would say that would be the easiest. You know, you, if you want to be a performer, get up in front of a crowd and perform, um, that'd be the, the, the best thing. Look, and I'm, 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 you're a you're a fantastic digital creator. Of course, that's that, that's got to be the way. You know, I'm learning from all you guys now of, of how to do this um, this game because it's changed so you know so much. Like I, you know, I, I came in and everything went on radio. You know, as I said, a few minutes later or the following day, everything's so instant now. So mm-hmm. if you're funny, you shouldn't you just be filming yourself doing something entertaining or talking about the latest news story and putting your spin on it and then uploading it that's Pretty all right yeah yeah that's, you know, um volume yeah volume yeah. for sure for sure so what what makes yeah so what makes it uh what makes something funny do you think uh oh it, you know uh, having having a thought that's different to what's going on in, in a uh, normal or cliched way mm. like you you going in the opposite direction is immediately funny i mean i i see my, you know, people people would say to me, oh, you know, other Aussies, oh, they, they, they you're there because they love the accent. And I'm like, well, I think they liked it for the first few months, but I'm dealing with maniacs. These guys haven't got to where they, you know, they're not, you know, I could sit here and say, g'day, good, you know, Bonza, you know, yeah. um, you know, or, you know and, 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 and the, the stick's going to run out yeah, quickly. Yeah, that's going to run out very quickly with these guys. I had to bring them... I had to bring them something, and 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 so I I, I, I had to quickly figure out how to bring value, mm. and my value that that they had never seen before, um, which 
leads to being funny is this big Australian who really knows nothing about media finding this little moment in New York red carpets where no (laughs) one was doing this. I swear, no one, there was no radio personality on these red carpets and I would get a spot on this red carpet uh, and I would be the last one on it and the person would get to me and I would not even know the person who I'm interviewing. And, you know, I'd interview Regis Philbin at the time, you know, he, he, Regis was on the biggest morning chat show on television who had been on that for 30 years. He was an American broadcasting legend and I'd be interviewing him, getting him tips from him about how to be a better interviewer. Um, I interviewed Walter Cronkite, who's like one of the greatest American news readers of all time, like a like a, a man of reverence that they uh, that they all love. And I, I was just, oh, you know, how am I going as how am I going as a reporter? You know this, and and Walter's giving me tips on, and and I think those moments where I would then take it into this morning show, that the absurdity of this guy that they plucked from complete obscurity, <laughs> you know, um, uh, that would turn up and be doing these interviews with, you know, Hollywood legends or sports stars or, I mean, it, just the premise of that was funny. Mm. And, and the only way you could go would be up from that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, <clears throat> as you're saying it, it really is, you, you, you stupid. got a, got a shot and you, yeah. you okay. actually got, you got a big break. Massive, a big, Ma- break. big break. Like it's a <laughs> stupid. Like I just, you know, it, it's the stupidest thing. Uh, you know that I got this. I, I say I got my foot in the door, but the door didn't really open up. And then I he made the door. Then I put my head through, and I'm like, "Geez, I like what I'm seeing in this party. What's going on here?" And then I, I pushed, my, squeezed my whole body in there, and then I'm in, but I'm not really in because I've got this red rope, or in some cases where I'm like at the SAG Awards, um, uh, and I'm behind a hedge that Ricky Gervais beautifully <laughs> pointed out from. They, I was in the shittest part of a red carpet that they put me behind a hedge. <laughs> And I was doing interviews. So I'm never really a part of this system, which was great, which was fine as well. But I would still end up in the party, you know, somehow hustling my way in. Um, and I would still be bringing these interviews with the biggest stars. So it was this sort of, a, a, you know, a, a, a great element of, Hustling, like one great example. I'm at the uh, Lord of the Rings after party of uh, when they after the third Lord of the Rings they win all the Oscars. So the first two they got a couple of Oscars, but this was the one where they sort of you know Oscars were rewarding them for pretty much the whole trilogy, mm-hmm. and it's at the Pacific Design Center, and they all come the red carp down the red carpet and. Um, and then they go into the, you know, Peter Jackson goes in and it's a big New Zealand moment. Everyone's yeah. celebrating New Zealand. And uh, I spot um, I spot Peter Jackson sneak off. I'm like, oh, I wonder where he's gone. Anyway, I, I sort of, he's gone through doors into a kitchen. And I walk into the kitchen. The kitchen's shut because it's like 3 a.m. by the stage after the Oscars. And it's Peter Jackson having uh, having a beer by himself in the corner of this kitchen. Just by himself. No phone. Just standing there. And this is pre when he was still a big boy with a big belly on him and I saw him there and I go Peter and he's like I could see him go oh shit who's this guy so I turn up I said mate how you doing yo well done and having a chat and you know get my have a quick interview with him and then I say oh can I you know get a photo with you and he puts he had three Oscars I think he'd won that night and he puts them and they're sitting on uh, tomato tomato canned soup boxes and it's me and him just go like this and and I just sit there and go this this is that was a great moment for me that I've that I've walked in on this other guy who couldn't believe he just won three Oscars for all his outstanding you know uh, achievement but he was in shock and we're sitting there and the Oscars are just sitting on a t- tomato can boxes um <laughs> So, uh, yeah, th- th- like rewarding experiences like that is w- what I was sort of always chasing. Mm. Well, mate, you're going to, when you go back to the Cobram pub at yeah. 80, fuck, you have some well, interesting stuff. I think stuff. a lot of my mates still think I'm a, an accountant, actually. The, the yeah. kid, <laughs> some kid's going to be at the pub, some like 18 year old, and you're going to be this old bloke just chilling there, drinking a beer in there. <laughs> you're going to start telling them all these stories, and I think you're a complete lunatic. Yeah, <laughs> lunatic. Yeah, because it doesn't, like, it doesn't, again, we've, we've, we've already, some, if there's one thing we could take from this, it doesn't make sense but I think in any great story or yarn and even in, in what you're achieving like you know none of it makes sense in these uh, in, in your early years and in my early years um, 
Uh, but, but the good thing is you got to keep going. You got to keep, keep, keep hustling. Mm. Well, uh, w- speaking of hustle, um, what were your techniques to hustle your way into things in New York? Because uh, I'm finding yeah. this is is a, is a skill that I'm needing to develop. Yeah, I'm uh, a bit too soft. Yeah, it it is it is hard. Like, uh, yeah, I'm soft now. I've become a bit more defensive in life. But mm. it, when I was on the offense, it was um, yeah. Look, look, the. <laughs> I would it'd get to a stage where I would plead with um, the, the the door ladies <laughs> of a party, you know, uh, to let me in. What's and an the, example? Well, uh, look, I, I went. There was one. It was the Sex in the City party. And I knew I had to get in because I was going to go live. Um, this is, I think this is oh eight, maybe oh nine. I knew I was going live. Uh, to Hamish and Andy, so I'd, I'd already done all the interviews with the. Um, with the Sex and the City ladies. So they'd all been sent off uh, and and I, I was going to do a few segments on their show, but they had to be from in the show. That's where the best part was going to be. And by then I'd created this great reputation of being able to put a celebrity on the phone to shows or to, you know, on moments like that, you know, that when you were alive or, or, or not. But so I get in, I go up to the lady and I said, look, she goes, she knew me. She goes, Brad, I can't have you in there. You'll be harassing the movie stars. I said, I'm not going to harass the movie stars. I've already got my interviews. I'm good. I'm just going to come in and have a drink and have something to eat. And I pleaded with her and she said, all right, you can come in this one time. I'll let you in. So uh, pleading is, is is one way. <laughs> Ple- pleading. Um, and that was good because I did get in and then Hamish and Andy rang me and I'm live. And um, that I, I have Mr. Big lined up and I go up to Mr. Big and I go, Mr. Big, Mr. Big, yo, um, Chris, Chris Knopf is his name. Chris, Chris, uh, I've got Hamish and Andy here from so Australia. Did they know who, yep. who Hamish and Andy no, were? No, no I go, well, I've got Hamish and Andy here from uh, Australia on the phone. Uh, can you have a chat to them? And, and Chris Knopf turns did to me. Did he tell you, did you tell yeah. him beforehand that you're no, going to- No, gonna- no, don't do any of that. No, <laughs> well, why? No, and then Chris Knopf turns around and, go, and says to me, Go fuck yourself, and um and and I get back on the phone, and all I can hear is Hamish and Andy pissing themselves <laughs> laughing, and I'm like, I was like a little bit upset, but in my head I'm like, it's pretty funny. I, I've done my job, yeah, <laughs> pretty and, funny. And, um, and and so does this guy hate you now though? Like, is he like you're staying away from him at the party no, from this point that's on? It. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just yeah, I just moved away. He you're didn't not. care. Then I'm going to do something else. Oh, like so it's not. Go. It's not like no, it's not no, re- no. In bad. The thing, it's just mo- he's taking the, the piss. Yeah, moments were moving so quickly like that that wouldn't have bothered him. Yeah. It, um. But in terms of getting in, uh, uh, a great one was I got rejected from the. I got rejected three weeks leading up to the Elton John Oscars party, uh, and. Uh, I got rejected, you know, and, and, and uh, uh, another friend of mine got accepted. I'm like, what the fuck? How's he get accepted? I got rejected. And I wrote this long email saying why I should be in the party. You know, we're on, I'm on WPLJ. I'm, we're the biggest radio station for Elton John music. And, you know, uh, I'll be able to promote you leading up and promote you the following day. And she just came back and said, no, nah, Brad, you're not coming in. All right. Damn. They um, knew you. So, sorry? They knew who you were too. Um, well, by this stage, I, I'd let her know that I've done this, I've done this, and, you know, but I don't know why she just said, no, nah, you're not coming. I, you know, did you give a reason? We're full. Um, I didn't want to be on the red carpet. I wanted to be actually in the party. Mm. And uh, and <laughs> so on the night, the Oscars happen. I'm at a mate's place. The guy that's going, to, you know, he's got his name on the list, and we're all dressed up. We got our tuxes on. We're watching the Oscars, and we're going to go. And my, we turn up, and they, and they feel really, really good. Back at the Pacific Design Center, actually in Beverly Hills, they've got checkpoints, police checkpoints. The first policeman, sort of, you know, no one can get past him. And uh, and he goes press credentials. And I, at this stage, I'd been in America eight years, but I'd always used my Victorian driver's license as a credential. And I showed him, my, <laughs> yeah, the green, the green license, and I'd hold that up, and the policeman's like. Uh, looked at it like, and I'm like, oh, I might be screwed here. And he goes, no, no, straight through. So, so go, like they didn't <laughs> they just no, look at through, yeah, didn't straight, look American no, 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 so no, they thought, yeah, oh, yeah, this yeah, is fine. Um, press credential, yeah. I'm going to use that. Yeah, 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 it's good. Try it. I'm telling you. It's you, a the, great that, trick. That green Australian green license. Yeah, 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 this is my, uh, yeah, this is my, and then um, uh, straight through. And then you get the girl. <laughs> then the next one is the young publicist girl with the Britney Spears headphones, I call them, you know, the, with the, the microphone yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and she's hearing everything. And I go up to her and I go, oh, uh, Brad Blanks, uh, WPLJ. And uh, she looks at the list and goes, um, 
no, nah, you're not on the list. Yeah, you know, it looks in the initial. Li- and I said, no, no, I am. I've been talking to, let's say, call Veronica all week. Uh, <coughs> And, I, and, and the one who's told you no. Told you no. So <laughs> yeah. you, you say if you and then Veronica and, and and you mention a few names. I always call it like Jedi mind tricks whenever <laughs> you're trying to get in. There. If you can sort of, it's the art of bamboozlement. <laughs> if you can bamboozle the young 22 year old uh, publicist that doesn't want to screw anything up because she doesn't know, could he be someone yeah, that we need? Could he be someone really yeah, important, yeah, important that's not on the list? Um, so important yeah, they're so not on the list. They're not on the list because it right. goes it yes. goes in like a like yeah. a thing. It's like yeah, a, for sure. The, the end points are you're not important enough, or you're so important that you should know. <laughs> That's right, and, and exactly, and and I and and then she's like, "All right, all right, just just go through, then go through," and I'm like, "Wow, I've got through this chick, but <laughs> my, my, and my buddy's gone. He's yeah, in. Yeah, he's yeah, left yeah. me. So, all right, I'm now. I have to walk down the red carpet, and then the, at the end of the red carpet, there's a desk that's pretty much once you pass the final boss, <laughs> and there's three ladies sitting there handing out the yellow wristbands, and uh, I go, "Hey, how you going, uh, Brad Blanks? WP? I don't even know what my reasoning was to do this because I knew I wasn't on the list. I go, "Brad Blanks, WPLJ," and she's looking at the list, and one woman goes, "No, no, I can't find you." And the next woman. And then I, what, she goes, what's your name? Uh, Brad Blanks. And then I hear one lady puts out, here's my name again, puts her head up and goes, Brad, I'm, I've told you, I've uh, emailed you. <laughs> She's like pissed off. You're not coming in. I, I told you you're not, you know, this, and then within that moment, as she's scolding me, the, uh, the crowd, the red carpet blew up. Everyone's excited. Um, I'm looking, I look around, she jumps straight up, you know, because she's the boss of the whole red carpet. She turns around and she just runs straight down the red carpet. And I look like this and I see the whole kerfuffle, there's fo- photographers going off and it's Prince with uh, four bodyguards. Prince starts walking down the red carpet and she's helping Prince. She's at the front because she, you know, she's got to get Prince in safely. Coming down and I'm like, holy shit. And I just walk straight behind Prince, shoulders back, and I've never looked tougher in my <laughs> life, you know, for an untough guy. And I, and I swear I elevated... I looked mean and I walked through. Were you wearing the and same outfit the as same, the other guys? Same outfit, we're Everyone's all in tuxes. <laughs> okay. yeah. Straight through, doors open, Prince and his crew go in one direction. I go straight to the bar, deep. <laughs> this is one thing you got to do. you got to go always go deep and always order a few beers to look like you're giving drinks to friends and whatever. I went straight down. I ordered four beers at the bar. Bang, and I'm like, I am in now, and I and I, and it was awesome. I'm just, but I went deep, and it was turned into an epic night. In I, was, I think I was the last one to leave, actually, the Elton John Oscar party. Um, <laughs> I think it was like 2006, uh, and the great the great thing about that was uh, Hamish and Andy had just gone national, or, or got added Sydney and Brisbane to. It was the first night of adding Sydney and Brisbane. They started in Melbourne in January, and this was like late February, maybe, and they added added that and uh and they went live to me throughout the show from the uh, Elton John so so again it was always to get good radio to get good audio and I was just lucky that and they, they were able to cross to me live as I'm in there and I remember I put Michelle Rodriguez on the phone and they asked her if um maybe she would like to have a kiss and a cuddle with me, you know, from Fast and Furious, Michelle Rodriguez. And she went, no way, like that to me. <laughs> um, anyway, but I did put um, the guys that created, well, what's the stop motion? So uh, again, you're going up yeah, to these people and yeah, be like, hey, I've got yeah, blah, blah, blah yeah, on the yeah, phone yeah, from yeah. Australia. Yeah, she's talking. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, Michelle what? Rodriguez And they're it. just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. hello? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they were talking to Hamish and Andy. It was great. The, <laughs> the, the, um, who's the guy that created the stop motion stuff um, from Wales? Um, he won an Oscar that night. Um, Wallace and Gromit? I don't know. Wallace and Gromit. Look, Wallace and Gromit. Anyway, it was, he won a best animation short film or something. And uh, Hamish was a big Wallace and Gromit fan. I remember I put him on the phone, you know, and he's sitting there with his Oscar. I think I'm holding his Oscar as he's doing his radio cross back to them. Um, but, but that's the thing. You got my, my whole thing. Just you got, keep keep on hustling into these uh, events. And Is it worth doing? Um, that event, right? Just like hustling, <laughs> you know, when you feel out of place, because the, the city's yeah, a could, could. city's a tough one. It's like a place where you feel like you don't belong a lot of the times, and you yeah. kind of just. But once you're in these places, you yeah. do belong. It's you do weird. Belong. You do it's belong. It's weird. You, 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 yeah, get you got to get in there. Yeah, yes, like yes, it's worth it. Get get in. I, the, there were moments where I went to a, I hustled into a George Clooney um, red carpet. Like in my, it was. 
in my first year and 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 George Clooney's introducing me to people <laughs> like like I, he was confused because he didn't know who, who this but I had an affable conversation with him he starts introduce maybe he was trying to foist me onto them yeah. but 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 I'm sitting there laughing at the, the the craziness that Clooney's introducing me to people at his own premiere party um but then you get other uh, events where it's all hustle which is uh like something like sundance film festival that i went to every year and and that was always about creating the stories that would then go on radio the following week mm -hmm. and the whole thing would be a hustle and you'd end mm -hmm. up in these cra you, you know, crazy crazy freezing cold outside then you'd be in these epic little parties in these mm -hmm. little um shops you could call them along main street and you'd be sitting there squashed up next to Woody Harrelson mm -hmm. so that it'd be worth being in these shows because you, you know, once you're in everyone's equal yeah in, yeah. in, my, in you know but you got to feel equal too don't get yeah. me wrong just screw it yeah for sure <laughs> I mean there's a it there seems like there's a tie between the self-deprecating humor that you would would go back to but um I had a question for you from a yep. while ago <clears throat> you, you're extremely good at taking this self-deprecating component yep. of humor and doing it in a tasteful way, but also not taking it genuinely personal and then not letting it like negatively yeah. affect you yep. as a human. Yep. So I wonder, do you think that came, that ability to maintain that, that solid foundation came from like a good family? Oh, or? Good question. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's good. Yeah. There's, you could take it. So it could all, always, how can I say it? If it's a weapon of your comedic arsenal, the self-deprecating thing, it can get tired. It can it, not necessarily tired for an audience. It can get tired for yourself. Yeah. You know? um, Cause you've got to have some confidence. Like yes. you need to sit there and have uh, some audacity around yeah. you by going into these yeah. rooms, but then also at the same time, you're taking the piss out of yourself. So how right. do you, how did you, how do you frame that in your mind to balance? Oh, that's a good, good question of how to figure out how to frame that. But I think it all, ca it always came back to what is the goal? Yeah. You know, What's the goal? What am I? What am I rooting myself here for? What am I trying to get out of it? And it was always moments of like, all right, this is awesome where I am now. If I play a role of, you know, arrogant guy in there, you know, that's not gonna. Well, there's nothing cool about that that I'm in there. Yeah. The fact that I'm in there and I'm I'm in this crazy party that I shouldn't be in to me is hilarious. Like that's, you know, and and that's. I know that's very self-deprecating, you know, but that is where my story would come. You know, that, that's where, because my goal was to do good radio, to have good output, to have mm. a good story to tell. And if that was my goal, then I couldn't go in. There's no story if it's easy for me to get in. You know, a, a good example of n not necessarily that or working on the mind frame. So I'm going to get back to, to that, what you said, but I, I worked for NBC for the Olympics and I'd, uh, I'd already done three Olympics with no credentials and then I finally get the credentials and work for NBC and I'm like, this kind of sucks. This is, everyone wants to talk to me here. This is like where when I didn't have credentials and I got an interview with Michael Phelps, it was like this euphoric experience and a, and a challenge and an adventure and the interview was so elevated that it was that he knew that he's talking to a guy that genuinely loved a bit. But when I had the NBC shingle around, you know, um, I was I was going in as a representative of them. The interview was all right. It was good. It was fine. But it's not. It wasn't a Brad Blank's interview or a Brad Blank's moment. It reminds me. Of, do you know who Nardwar is? Yes. Yes. It I reminds do. me yeah. of Nardwar, but yeah. in the in the film and sports world. Yeah. Yeah. He, he, he did a great job, didn't he? Yeah. yeah. He. Um. Uh. But the the framing of the mind. Look. Uh, yeah. It's just. I, I think it was. It's always having a goal. Having that. What, what you want? What do you want to get out of the moment? Mm. If I wanted to go to a party and just be cool and have a drink with my mates, yeah, you'd do that too then you wouldn't tell the story about it. But mm. if my goal was to go in there and go, this is awesome. I'm going to, I'm going to frame, this is going to go straight on radio the following Monday morning. And I'm going to get as much out of this moment without collecting audio. And the story has to fit w in what the character I was on that morning radio show. Yeah, so yeah. there was always a bit of a purpose as much yeah. as it was. It seemed like a free for all and me just, yeah, a, a crapshoot. 
Mm. Do you think the character created the human a little bit? Like, did did you playing that character for so long now turn you in partially <laughs> into who you are yeah. as a person? Uh, or was it the other way? No, I think it was the other way. I think I always, I loved those. I loved Norman Gunston as a kid, which was a great Australian, you know, you know very much aging myself. I <laughs> Look, I loved, you know, I, I, I loved all, yeah, you know, I grew up on all, you know, watching Andrew Denton on the ABC on Tuesday nights and I, I loved Hey Hey It's Saturday. I loved all, I loved a- anyone that was sort of, you know, uh, overdoing what their character was, you know, sure. um, and, you know, being a, a larger than life sort of personality. And I, I think it was always in me and, and it was right around the top. Look, uh, I was a, you know, I was in London, I was living in London, 97, 98, 99, which was a special time to be in England, you know, from, a pop culture point of view it was the birth of um you know uh, Borat mm-hmm. and uh Ali G of, of course was before Borat but part of that on the well, thing was on the 11 o'clock show on channel four and I would see him you know Ali G do his first interview interviewing kids I think it was I'm like this is mind-blowing what yeah. I'm seeing but I'm so excited to see this because this has been I it wasn't new to me because I'd seen it with Norman Gunston. I'd seen, I'd also seen it with Dennis Pennis, who was like your notorious red carpet, you know, um, interviewer that was just blowing celebrities up. Um, yeah, and then I saw Ali G. So all that was culminating into, you know, the irony, what, the yeah, ironic the, people. Yeah, the, yeah, 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 and 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 then knowing that I wasn't going to be them. They, these guys are geniuses, but I was able to take those elements and use them to create these funny moments with characters and then it gets back to what we're talking about the the whole the whole comedy of a moment this guy that's not meant to be there the the ultimate fish out of water story that's disheveled no fashion sense and at a hollywood red car or new york city red carpet outside the ziegfeld theater interviewing tom cruise and i'm i'm you know i'm dressed terribly and um but but it yeah, you know, that, that all that culminated in making that that character. Yeah, uh, it was all, awesome, awesome run. I love it. I love it. So, with that in mind, um, if you were to start your career in media again today <laughs> oh, in New geez. York City, what would you be doing? Oh, geez. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. Asking for a friend. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh my goodness, what a what a Joe. time. Yeah, <laughs> what a time it is. Um, yeah, well, Joe's crushing it. I think he's doing well on his mate dates. I love watching those. They're they're awesome. And uh, um, but yeah, look, you know, how would you do it now? It's crazy. How do you break through when everyone is a creator? Everyone's everyone is a radio personality. Everyone is a you know radio personality now. It, you know, and like in sports, every which is awesome to see. And then you get these great people pop out in the sports world who are who get, end up getting million dollar con- contracts and get to interview yeah that, that's the thing now these people are just pop you know you grind away on instagram and then a year later you can be getting the big star to talk to you because mm. they're their fans um mm. <laughs> look i don't think i'm going to give any new spin on it my, my whole thing was it, you've got to keep pushing yourself into adventures. Um, I think no matter what medium it is, you've got to wake up and want to have an interesting story to tell. Mm. But if it's going to be yourself you're putting on camera, you've got to put yourself into those positions to create, to, to have, to, to be able to fight your way out of. I said mm. it before where I, I'm, I, my best interviews was where I was absolutely fucked and I'm in a corner and I'm, and I'm stammering even, even, and I don't even know where my thoughts are. And this interview is sucking. And then I've got to get out of that. I, I think even that in a life scenario, put yourself into such an uncomfortable spot that you fighting out of that spot will be the story. And, and, and if you capture that, however you want to capture it on video or you post it wherever or have it be part of a greater podcast or show, I think that they're the things that will, will um, make you a great media um entertainer performer mm. because I personally I love this medium I, this is not something that I was planning on doing and then it just started happening and I noticed um, I noticed every time I would do a podcast I would leave energized and I'm like you, you hear about careers that you should t- go down 
when you feel you get energy from the yep. actual act of doing the work right every time just like oh it's wow so that's good fired up. all right yeah so yeah. fired up it's so yep. much fun yeah and 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 yes and that's the feeling i i would get you know after i do something you achieve something you don't know where it's going to go after you do it but you know you did what was right for you mm-hmm. like you doing a podcast and interviewing people and if you go out tonight and you're still pumped up you can't even get to sleep because you ask the right questions or you get you bugs yourself that you ask the wrong question at the wrong time which is also part of it too you yeah know, that whole oh i could have gone there a bit more but doesn't matter i got that yeah and you've sort of got to have be satisfied of what you got which then probably creates the energy mm. um that will probably keep you up to i don't know about tonight but i've mm-hmm. seen some of your other great interviews um you know um keeps you up you know fired up and so it's well great. done thank you Thank you. That's good. It's a good thing. It's uh, yeah. It's been been very interesting, and I don't know. I don't know where this goes at all. But uh, it's you know, I get to sit here for two hours and speak to somebody yeah, like yeah, yourself. Yeah, yes. Yeah. I think the medium's a little bit different though, which I'm figuring out personally because mm. it's like the short form is very like go yes. go go, and yeah, that go, sounds go, like the right. sound bite work yes. that you were doing. Yes. This is like long, long. slow narratives, yeah, 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 like yeah, weaving yeah. stories into yep. anecdotes, yes. into like ideas, into yep. it's. Oh, it's a, it's a, a bit it's of a different dance. class. Yeah, it's yeah, a, it's a yeah, bit yeah, of a it dance. Is a dance. It is for sure. Um, yep. But uh, yeah, we'll see. I mean, we're seventy something episodes in now. So oh, good, good. We're good. just getting started. Keep going. Yes, yeah. don't don't stop. Yeah. This is uh, exciting. Yeah, and uh, we, with with with. With all of the digital side in mind, um, like with the rise of influencers, social media, digital personalities, yep. etc., what role do you see in like the traditional entertainment slash journalism? world uh, evolving is there any value in it or is it, uh, a, is it dead in the water no 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 i think there's value i think uh i, I, I think what, what i've noticed now on red carpets they're all influencers that line up on the red carpets but they're not they're not even personality driven the people asking the celebrities what their top five favorite pizzas are in new york and in my elementary knowledge of digital media, I get why they're doing that because that can be cut up and then put online. Yeah. But I'd like to see more, but is there any value in an influencer having a big personality and interviewing a celebrity on a red carpet? Maybe there's not, maybe the investment of time isn't there. And if you said it to me, the investment of time I put into interviewing celebrities, really I shouldn't have been doing it Mm. because it was so much work like that's why I was the only one there. You know, it was three hours of my night every night in New York, standing there. Um, but I knew if I got that one minute ten, it would mean something. And if someone maybe took that on and still had that idea, then it then it then it would work. But but again, people are doing them in podcast forms and chopping the video up and putting it online. So mm. you know, there's podcasts out there maybe are filling that role of and you know but in terms of red carpet reporting i it, it, it i i don't know if there's any budgets out there that would cover that anymore mm. you know um you know i'd be standing there with entertainment tonight you know um uh, access hollywood extra and then it would be ap and reuters and now there's you know there's a few new york posts and a, a, a few others that are all there but well, if you really think about it, who, where is, I would always be going there. I'm the only one other than maybe the big three. I'm the only one where these interviews are getting played in full. There was no one, it's, I didn't, it's not as though we go online and see all these amazing red carpet interviews. Maybe there's a massive void in the market where some young influencer could come along and just start doing entertainment interviews and putting more personality, you know, um, personality into it. But, but maybe. the whole, Maybe, Maybe. Uh, teach me your ways. Yes, go out there. Yes, <laughs> young Jedi. Yeah, um, yeah. Don't look. And again, that I would be fun. That would I, be fun I, I, for Instagram. I wouldn't wish wish it on you either. <laughs> in, in, in this other other way, if you get them to come to this amazing studio and sit with you for two hours, that might be more. That's the uh, goal. Yeah, that, that'd be that it. is the goal. That is the um, end goal. There's but, some yeah. some people that I would love to interview that yep. just you know heroes of mine, or you know that you can tell there's some there's some movie stars or artists and stuff that have a very, very great philosophy on the world. Yep. And to just talk to them about that philosophy would just be an amazing conversation. That's, that's, that's a dream eventually. Good. I'm I'm confident for it. But, but yeah, on that note though, on what, where everything's transformed and where, where we are, I sit here and think to myself, what actually is my, what a big mainstay of my job in New York for, 19 years or my craft or at the end of the day was being a morning show 
um, sidekick and mm. the ability to sit within a show and have comments jumping around the room yeah. and being able to react to those comments and throwing my two cents in and to keep a story going. Mm-hmm. Obviously, there's a host that drives that, mm-hmm. but to keep that all going, that was a really fun, energetic Great creatively experience to go in and do that for, you know, three hours a day mm. is awesome. Mm. Uh, but that model isn't really that like it is uh, in podcasts. It is in podcasts. It podcast. is in podcasts. It is, it in is podcast. 100% yes. in podcasts. Yes, it is in podcasts, but it's not so much uh, revered in yeah. morning show radio anymore. Because well, you don't yeah. need morning show radio because no, right. you've got podcasts. That's right. So the, the, yeah. the game now is the content is the easy part. The distribution is the hard part. Right. But that's it, where that, the, the you know, old radios and TV channels, yep. they have the distribution, but yeah. they lack the content right. because the people who are good at content don't need them anymore. Yes. They do their own thing. And then they get begged by these like legacy you know outlets yep. with distribution to come on board. And they're like, why yeah. the fuck would I? I'm making yeah. um, $2 that's million right. dollars a year yeah, yeah. doing this yes. thing yes. Not with a Patreon. I don't need you. No, no. That's so it's an interesting space yeah, to be is. in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but so, yeah, it's, I, I did a job that really doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. Moment yeah. in time. Yeah. It, you know, cause it wouldn't exist. And then radio's changed because it's all, you know, it's been um, focus tested that big personalities don't really work anymore. Really? Yeah. So what works? Uh, music. Okay. Play, play music, music or talk talk back. Okay. With pol- political talk back. Yeah. yeah. Let's go go where the money is and. Okay. Anyway, so uh, yeah, my job doesn't exist. There you yeah. go. Like a yeah. So that's like a, more like a church, like a steam train engineer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but, but anyway, horse and cars. Yeah, horse, horse and cars. I mean, it does. Yeah. I guess if you want to go to um, Central Park, I guess it does yeah. exist. In Australia, so. it still smashes too. Yeah, Cr- crushes still, horse which is cart. awesome. <laughs> no horse and cart. No uh, morning show, uh, radio. It's just in New York. It's a different beast. Yeah. It's uh, changed. But I Australia is still. Yeah, yeah. You know, you know, I, I tell Aussies that I'm like, yeah, um, the the radio business is so different to in Australia. I mean, you know, Kyle and Jackie O. What do they make? Ten million a year, and then you've uh-huh. got, you know. Um, yeah, the Melbourne radio shows are awesome. You know, um, you know, Fifi Box is still, mm. you know, superstar there, and yeah. So it's a different. It just doesn't doesn't work in 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 New York as much as it did. What do you think yep. changed? Uh, no, again, uh, focus groups or not focus groups. Uh, the, the, do you pay a morning show radio guy two million dollars a year, uh, which they would have? back in the O's or the late 90s uh, when you're not earning that much. You mm. know, when, when the station's not, you know, back in the day, WPLJ had incredible revenues mm. and so they're able to pay talent to come on and be a part of that and the revenues just aren't there like the the days of even 10 years ago. It's mm. all just diminished. Um, and, you know, money goes now to internet and YouTube and the advertising dollars at the end of the day, it's the advertising dollars yeah. aren't there anymore. Yeah. Makes sense. So look, I, I'm conscious of time. I want to talk to about a, a few like philosophical questions right. and then we'll finish it up. So um, what views, what views do you have that would make most people either scratch their heads or potentially get angry? Oh no. Well, I, I, I try, I try and I try to stay in a non angry environment. Um, or a, an odd thing that you have, uh, an odd view of the world that you have where people go, that's strange. Oh, golly. Yeah, that's, I, this is, I think I've been well trained on uh, mainstream radio not to have those views. <laughs> and um, then the, the out of your yeah. brain. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, the funny thing is I, I, was, on a, um, I was on a show in Minneapolis uh, for 22 years and uh, a weekly segment and the guy who uh, I'm friends with, Tom Bernard, I knew early on that he was, very, you know, he, he he sounded like he was very right, not very right, right wing um, morning show, and I and I would come on and he would say these views at the time, and you know, they weren't outlandish, but I'm like, wow, I'm on a, this is a pretty political show at times, and I just said, I, I'm and and he's actually, it's funny now because he's probably become more of a centrist over the years mm. um, now. Um, He's not on – this station was KQRS, but he does a podcast now. But but I, I sort of went, you know, whenever I was up against that, it was – I'll be like, well, I'm not a very political person and I'm just trying to have a laugh here. Once I start bringing that into it, you know, a, an opinion on things, 
I think things would, would go sideways for me. <laughs> you know, um, so I, I can't answer your question, but it's a good question though. Um, so I have, sorry, I didn't even answer it. That's okay. <laughs> what, what's the biggest thing over the last two years you've changed your mind on? Uh, the biggest thing over the last two years or yeah, two, sure, years? two years? Two um, years, whatever. Uh, um, um, geez. I wish I, I wish I hadn't have sold my Bitcoin. Oh yeah. man, <laughs> no, there's still time. Yeah, yeah, still time. There's still time. All right, good. Maybe, um, yeah, maybe it is going to go up it to a million up. dollars. All right, it, it will go. It I would, go st- I would start buying. Start it again. buying again. I've right. just been, bu- I've just been putting a hundred dollars in a week for. Oh, good on a you. year. Just oh, good. Just oh, that's smart. All right, yeah, well, hundred bucks or hundred because yeah. it's gonna go. It's gonna move. It's gonna and move. it is moving. All right. All right. All right. So yeah, I'll show you something later. All right. Good. I sold it. <laughs> Damn. No, yeah. no. 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 You still can buy it. All right. Yeah. Um. So, big. It's basically you. You like Bitcoin now? Is what you're telling me. Oh, I know. Yeah. Yeah. I, I bought it at six thousand. I sold it at twenty. Damn. Yeah. Yeah. Damn. Damn. It's going to a hundred. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's going to hundred. Going to hundred. All right. You still got time. All right. Um. What's the kindest thing anyone's ever done for you? Ah. Uh, oh, my wife does kind things for me. Um. All the time. Yeah. And then my kids. Yeah. You know, like. Um. Like I just had a birthday. So. Yeah. You know, Happy birthday. Yeah. Thank you. They. They buy me presents and write me nice cards, and I've, I've never been very good at accepting stuff like that. So I, it, it, it weirdly embarrasses me. So I, I think that's quite kind that they um, keep yeah, doing it, even yeah, though it embarrasses, it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it embarrasses me or whatever. You know, but kindness. You know, yeah, um, I'd say that. Yeah, wife and kids doing nice things for me. Nice. Yeah, and um, if you could know the absolute truth to one thing, what would it be? Ah. Oh. Who killed JFK? God, we know it's the CIA. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. I've like, given you a layup there. All right. Um, do, do the uh, are there did uh, are there ali- aliens really in New Mexico? In is that true? I don't know. I don't yeah, know Roswell. You know the. Yeah. I don't know. Um, probably. Probably. Um, probably. Who really? Else? Is that really the one thing yeah, you yeah. could learn? Yeah, I think so. That's the yeah, one. Yeah, I think that, <laughs> that's uh, it. What else? Out of everything you could possibly yes, yeah, know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's I, where you're going I, with I think them. I'll get a few more. Geez, you're going to give me a lot of anxiety here to wake up in the- <laughs> I'll wake up in the middle of the night and I'll be like, oh, you know, because I know you've given me a, th- a couple of three-pointer questions and I think I've only answered two and then waffled right. on the third, so I'm, I'm right. sorry. You miss 100% yeah. of the shots you don't take, yeah, yeah, so that's yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. good, good, So, Brad, is there anything exciting that you're- anything you're excited about at the moment you want to let the listeners in on um i, I look I, I, as i said um things have changed from the days when i walked in off the street to a radio station uh and and then i went on this uh, just this crazy ten, journey 10 year <laughs> journey on this show and then i left that and went out on my own and made some crazy things and did olympics work and you know tried my hand at making my style of documentaries and and then i went back into radio again and did another nine years um, as a little bit more mature, I guess. Look, I, I'm, I'm, I'm an optimist, so I wake up and I'm excited about the future. But mm-hmm. it's just, um, as you, you know, I, I think my advice to myself would be you've got to keep attacking. Mm. And even though, you know, you, when you get married, you have three kids, you become a bit more defensive. Yeah. You know, um, I wouldn't want to embarrass my family by doing, you know, covering my body with 72 bottles of uh, m- French's mustard. I mean, I think um, they know what they're getting <laughs> yeah, themselves, they've right. gotten themselves yeah, into yeah, at this yeah, point. Yeah, yeah, I think my son, my 15 year old son was very impressed that I was at Kanye, one of Kanye's very first musical performances at Sundance Film Festival. Yeah. Um, so sending in the list. Yes, yeah, the like, trust me. Thank you. Yeah, this um, is what happens. It's okay. Yeah, yeah. That so sometimes you got to exactly. spread some mustard. <laughs> but that's right. Spread some mustard, and uh, um, so I think um, the greater. I, I, I think I've got to keep getting into adventures and placing myself into those adventures where you know where when I can leave the family and go off and, and travel and see what can happen. You know, yeah. Um, there's there's still wonderful, great days ahead. Yeah. Love it. And uh, where can people find you if they're interested? Um, look, my Instagram at Brad Blanks, you know, my ex at Brad, everything's at Brad Blanks. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I'm even still on Facebook at Brad Blanks page, <laughs> but I'm uh, Brad Blanks.com and YouTube Brad Blanks. I've got a 
I think I've got 600 old interviews yeah. sitting up there that I've still got to add more to. Um, you know, but there's some old gems through there, like the Gervais ones. So you funny. Can, you can see uh, oh. Lin- Lindsay Lohan signed my man boob. She didn't, she, didn't talk, <laughs> she, didn't, she didn't talk to anyone at all on that red carpet. And I had a really good relationship with Lindsay because right through her, you know, she was, her family's from Long Island. They were listeners of the radio station. So I, I'd always get an interview with her. And then she became, you know, was the biggest star in terms of, you know, whatever clicks were in 2007 and no, she didn't talk to anyone on this red carpet and she saw me and came over and uh, I said oh my guys will uh, donate to charity if you sign my man boob and she goes you want me to sign your man boob right now and I pulled my boob out and, <laughs> and, and she and she signed it and um, it was epic it was a, a great moment and everyone because no one got any footage of her You're like what the fuck yeah, so, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah it's me and my man boob so uh, all the entertainment programs were were like, yeah, Lindsay Lohan didn't talk to, on Access Hollywood, didn't talk to anyone last night. But Except she, for. She did see this one uh, guy and he, she signed his man boob. And then sadly for Lindsay, a week later was when she had a car accident on Sunset Strip and uh, they found coke in a oh, glove box shit. or whatever. And um, and that went, um, that was the biggest story in the entertainment world. It was the beginning of her downfall. Mm. And uh, I was getting texts from people all over the world because Reuters had obviously sold the footage of you know uh, of her signing my man boob, and that was the footage of her going crazy. Oh yeah. shit! <laughs> yeah, so it was you, it was me. <laughs> but she's making a comeback now. She makes Christmas movies now, so she's going to be she's back to being a star. She's going to be uh, on Netflix this coming Christmas. So Brilliant. good stuff, Lindsay. Yeah, yeah we love nice. you. Yeah, Lindsay's great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> la- last question for all of this uh, is, what do you think the meaning of life is? Uh, oh, that's a ripper. Um, I, I, I think it's uh, good banter, uh, good chats, good people, um, and, you know, continually meeting new people, everyone being open to uh, um, meeting new people and sort of finding your common um, uh, uh, loves um, or moments to, to, to chat about. That, that'd be my thing, I think, yeah. Just think good that's connections. Like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't spend much time in pubs anymore, but I like a. I always loved a good pub chat yeah. with someone to figure out what, what's going on in their neck of the woods. Yeah, nice. Um, Brad Blanks, thank you so much right. for your time. Adam, thank you for your energy. Yeah, thank you. This is uh, amazing. You're, uh, you're an inspiration. Oh, Seriously. Well, Seriously well, thank you. you. All right, thank you. Yeah, yeah. and uh, well done. Keep uh, to young Aussies, uh, come to New York. Yeah, come yeah, to New yeah, York. Yeah, 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 it's good fun here. It's uh, it's still 24 years I still walk around the streets of New York and I'm like, I still feel like it's my first day. So you is, don't lose that? No. Because I'm you wondering if no. I was going to lose it. So you no, don't no, lose no. it? No, no. I think, yeah, th- th- I, I'm sure there's a group of people that say you lose it, but just keep the attitude. Try not to lose it because I'll walk around and go, I still can't believe I live here. Yeah. I mean, this is nuts. This yeah. is this place is insane. And uh, it's like, you know, if you have a good attitude and positivity and figure out how to break, uh, you know, I always say if you can break even in New York, um, financially, you stay as long as you can. Yeah, you got um, stories to, stories tell, for years. to tell for years. Exactly. Can't wait to go to the cop, the, yeah, the yeah. Geelong pub. Uh, yeah, you're for you, <laughs> yes, the Geelong pub, Geelong legend. Well done, mate. Yeah, thanks, Adam. Of course. And uh, look, if anyone's made it this far, please subscribe, give the podcast a rating, let us know your thoughts on the Q and A, the comments. Love to hear from you. Till next time.